A kindly looking old woman is carrying groceries into her home. When she closes the door, a crack forms in the wall and a tile slides down off her roof, crashing to the ground and shattering. The next day, the local builder seems confused. He just fixed a similar problem a week ago at another house, and another the week before that. He'll patch this crack just like he did before and repair the roof, but as he does so, he can't help but think he'll be at another house with the same problem soon. Old people are like this sometimes, though, breaking things on purpose to get someone to come visit them. Oh well, as long as the money is right, he'll keep doing the repairs. That evening, the old woman is in bed when she's woken up by something falling onto her face. A crack is opened in the ceiling right above her bed and plaster is falling on her. What is happening to this house? She would have to call the builder again in the morning and let him know that it was getting worse. She gets up to clean the plaster dust off her face, but stops halfway to the door. Was that a noise she heard? It sounded like it was coming from downstairs. Another noise. She definitely heard something. Is someone in her home? Hello? She cries out. Whoever you are, you better go. My husband is going to be home any moment, and he won't be happy. The noises seem to have stopped. Maybe she was imagining things. Who would rob a poor old woman after all? She didn't have anything worth taking. She still needs to wash the plaster off her face, though. She listens for a moment, and when she doesn't hear anything else, she opens the bedroom door and screams. The next day, a child stands in front of the house with a look of shock. Was there an earthquake? How could a house end up like this? They ring the doorbell, but there's no answer. They knock on the door and are surprised to find that the door is open. Grandma? The child cries into the quiet house. No response. The child enters and looks around. The house is a mess. Chunks of plaster have fallen off the walls and ceiling. Shelves have fallen over, spilling their contents. And there's broken glass from shattered light bulbs everywhere. The boy looks up the stairs and can see that his grandmother's bedroom door is open and the light is on. Grandma, are you up there? Still no response. The child nervously starts up the stairs, gripping the railing tight. They quietly make their way to the bedroom and step into the sliver of light coming from the cracked door. The child pushes the door open to find their grandmother on the floor. Only, it isn't their grandmother. Whatever this is looks like their grandmother, but like she has been stretched and twisted, her body bent at angles where no joints exist. The child is paralyzed with fear, unable to do anything but stare. But the nightmare isn't over yet, because their grandmother is still alive. Sadly, reports like these are all too common in this small town that is plagued by attacks from SCP-783, also known as the Crooked Man. SCP-783 is an extremely dangerous anomalous creature that is currently plaguing the population of Temby, a small rural village in Oxfordshire, England. Every 12 years during the fall and winter months, SCP-783 will engage in a period of hostile behavior that lasts for roughly 70 days, during which time it will target and attack people who are indoors and alone after sunset. Those targeted by SCP-783 will find that the building they are in rapidly deteriorates, causing damage and creating structural integrity issues. These often appear as cracks on the outside of the building that lead to the buildings taking on a crooked appearance. Unfortunately, while the SCP Foundation is aware of both the location and the periods within which SCP-783 operates, it has so far been unable to prevent any attacks. Additionally, the Foundation has yet to be able to produce either an image or even a physical description of SCP-783 due to the effect it has on recording equipment. Cameras set up to capture the anomaly produce only distorted or corrupted footage, leaving its appearance a mystery. Victims targeted by SCP-783 meet a fate that is, in many ways, worse than death. Their bodies will experience extreme deformations, as their bones suffer dozens of fractures and are stretched and twisted in various unnatural directions. They are then healed by the rapid generation of cartilage and the growth of extra skin to cover the new elongated limbs, leaving the victims a malformed knot of gnarled extremities. Some of the cases are quite severe, with one victim having just their forearm extended to over 2.4 meters and another who was left stretched to 12.5 meters in height. Despite the gruesome injuries suffered, 
the majority of victims are still alive following the attacks, though they will more often than not be left completely paralyzed in a persistent vegetative state, or both. 27 victims of SCP-783 are currently being held in a long-term care facility within a wing of a local hospital that was requisitioned by the Foundation specifically for the care and treatment of 783 victims. Like many of the anomalies that the SCP Foundation investigates and contains, many of the residents of Tembi appear to have some awareness of the Crooked Man, and the anomaly has become something of a local boogeyman. Researchers have even documented local schoolchildren singing a nursery rhyme that appears connected and may even explain the origins of the creature. It goes, There lived a crooked man who made a crooked deal. He kept a crooked cane and his catch in crooked creel. He stole a crooked child who cried a crooked squeal. And that crooked little man was broken on the wheel. A month before a recent SCP-783 period of activity was to begin, a Class D personnel, D-209, was sent to live in a Foundation-owned home in the village. Audio and video recording equipment was set up throughout the house in case the D-Class was targeted, in the hopes that some information could be gleaned should something take place. 43 days after he began living in the house, something finally did. One evening while in bed reading a book, D-209 heard noises on the ground floor of the home. Cameras on the first floor experienced corruption and showed only a distortion moving through the house. When D-209 attempted to leave the bedroom and escape the home, they immediately encountered SCP-783. During a period of time that lasted roughly five hours, their bones were broken numerous times and reset over and over, leaving D-209 a twisted mass of flesh and bone. Strangely, at the exact same time that D-209 was being attacked, all 27 of the living prior SCP-783 victims in the hospital experienced violent seizures, despite most of them having been declared functionally brain-dead and the rest being totally paralyzed. Also concurrent with the attack was a seismic event on the outskirts of town, and the details revealed by this event were both illuminating and extremely disturbing. Foundation personnel were dispatched to the site of the seismic activity to investigate and determine if it was connected to SCP-783 in any way. There, they found a small group of angry townspeople, perhaps frustrated by seemingly unending paranormal events in their town and the lack of progress that had been made to stop them. After a tense standoff, SCP Agent Collins fired her service weapon into the air, and the crowd quickly scattered. Now, free of distraction, the agents could begin their investigation in earnest. They immediately spotted several objects sticking out of the earth. Upon closer inspection, these were identified as elongated human toes. A dig team was sent to the site, and by the next day, a mass grave had been uncovered that was filled with the twisted mass of what appeared to be victims of SCP-783. Their mutated and drawn-out bodies were well-preserved despite being buried directly in the ground, and had all been buried head down, with their arms extending deeper into the burial pit. As one researcher was attempting to take a tissue sample from one of the bodies, the ground beneath him gave way and he fell into the pit. He landed on the tangled mass of limbs which shifted under his weight, and he disappeared into the pit beneath them. Agent Collins immediately found a length of rope, tied it to her waist, and climbed into the pit with instructions to the on-site team to pull her back up when she signaled. Agent Collins descended into the pit beneath the bodies, and after several minutes, she was extracted, though without the missing researcher. At debriefing, she described how she found an anomalous location under the ground beneath 783's victims' corpses, and she was so rattled by what she saw that she was granted a temporary leave of absence. The Foundation had to know more, and a D-Class personnel was quickly selected for exploration of the underground anomaly. D-2172 was equipped with audio and video recording equipment, along with several scientific measurement tools as well as a firearm, and was lowered down into the pit via crane. Their wired tether to the surface would both send the information they collected back as well as serve as their lifeline to the surface. As D-2172 was lowered past the mass of corpses into the darkness, they experienced a sense of vertigo before it was realized that the anomalous effects extended to gravity as well, which had become reversed, and that they would need to start climbing up in order to descend further into the pit. They soon climbed out of the hole surrounded by the reaching, extended arms of corpses and emerged into an open world with an overcast sky. It looked exactly like the town of Tembi, 
with the same buildings present there as in our world. The world appeared to be uninhabited, though, with no sign of the missing SCP Foundation researcher. D-2172 began investigating the buildings and found them all to be empty as well, though they did unfortunately find signs of a struggle in one house, with what looked to be evidence of the missing researcher's demise. They continued exploring the area and found that the anomalous properties of the location extended to its borders too. And as the D-Class walked north out of the town, after several kilometers, they found that they were now somehow back at the southern edge of the town. D-2172 was ordered to return to the entry point, but as they walked, they were suddenly impeded by the deformed body of an SCP-783 victim that stretched across the road in front of them. D-2172 drew and fired their weapon at the entity, but it didn't react, and they were forced to retreat into the nearby woods. After several minutes, they stopped to rest when they spotted something else. In the distance, the D-Class saw what looked to be a giant white birch tree, and it was coming towards them. As the living tree approached, it became clear that it wasn't a tree at all. What looked like branches were extended bony fingers that it was using to walk. The long, branch-like fingers were coming out of the top of the tree, where D-2172 could see their origin. These branches were the elongated fingers of the missing SCP Foundation researcher. D-2172 turned to run as the giant living tree chased them back into the town, firing their weapon at the creature whenever they had the chance, but was unable to stop it. The visual feed was soon lost as the audio continued to broadcast the screams of D-2172. But this wasn't the end of the expedition. The on-site team was surprised to witness after several hours that the tether was pulled on twice, the signal that it should be reeled in. A medical team was sent to the site since it was assumed that D-2172 would need immediate care, and the team began reeling in the line. After several minutes, they spotted the harness that should have been strapped to D-2172, but with nothing in it. They continued to pull, but the harness became stuck on the mass of corpses in the pit. They then noticed that it wasn't actually stuck. There was a hand holding onto the harness for dear life. It was D-2172's hand. The team kept pulling as D-2172's arm kept stretching out of the pit to a length of over three meters. But eventually, the resistance became too much. D-2172 lost its grip, and it was seen sinking back into the mass of corpses inside the pit. Following this expedition, it was determined that only special operations teams and mobile task forces would be used to explore the dangerous anomalous location in the future. At least three such expeditions have been undertaken, though the details remain classified for the time being, and perhaps it is for the best if they remain so. The SCP Foundation will continue to monitor the town of Tembi in an attempt to learn more about SCP-783 and hopefully discover a means to contain it and its related phenomena. Due to the difficulty in containing the anomaly, it has been classified as Keter, and a local building adjacent to the Tembi Hospital has been requisitioned and designated as Provisional Site 5 in order to accommodate the increased Foundation presence. As the SCP Foundation continues to research this mysterious and highly dangerous anomaly, any victims of SCP-783 are to be retrieved, their injuries catalogued, and then their bodies are to be incinerated. Seeing that shadowy figure coming towards him makes the worker turn and run. He hasn't had the time nor the luxury of freezing on the spot, or waiting for it to get closer so he could get a clearer view. He just runs. With every pace, every hurried, horrified step, comes the mental image of the strange figure gaining on him. In his head, every movement he catches in the corner of his eye, every shuffling sound he detects, the thing was right behind him, inches away and ready to strike. So he just keeps on running. Only seconds ago, it was just standing under a streetlight, a ways ahead of the worker, barely moving. He calls out to it, assuming it's a person, somebody may be lost or in need of help. But then, it steps into the light, and it's not a person at all. The head of the suit isn't on properly, it droops at an angle like it hasn't been affixed or is barely hanging on. The crude, lazy-eyed face is haphazardly drooping. That too isn't on right, as the entire head sways unnervingly with each approaching step. Maybe underneath the suit, hiding beneath all that dirty orange fur, still coated in grime despite the rain, perhaps there's a person in there, whose arm hefts an old baseball bat as they plod closer and closer to the worker. But all he sees is the monster. The filthy costume might be clumsily made, 
but the worker instantly recognizes the all-too-familiar resemblance of an orange cat from a popular comic strip. It's what starts him running. That, and the blunt weapon the monster is holding, as it menacingly makes its way closer. The downpour doesn't let up as the worker turns a corner, met with the sights of two bright, blinding white beams of light cutting through the rain. A car, speeding its way down the road. It catches the worker in its headlights, and he starts frantically waving his arms, encased in the sodden fabric of his jacket. Help! Oh, please! Please help me! He yells. Something's coming after me! I think it's trying to kill me! The driver doesn't stop, instead simply cruising past. The worker can just about see through the passenger side window, the vehicle's sole occupant giving him a strange look from inside the safety of his car. Almost as quickly as it appears, the car has driven off, its headlights already fading from view thanks to the rain. What the worker doesn't realize is that the driver's look of confusion wasn't directed at him, but at the thing following him. The creature gives a low, animalistic sound, which causes the worker to spin around. Now he sees it, right up close in all its foul, ginger glory. A tail dangles lazily from the lower portion of the suit, trailing in puddles laden with muck, the water making the fur even dirtier than it already is. It's so close that the awful, pungent stench of the thing hits the worker's nostrils, a sickening smell that somehow seems to fit with the grim, gross costume and its wearer. Seeing the wet, fur-coated suit so close, he realizes that it isn't covered in the soft, plush, synthetic coat that he expects a costume like that to be made of. It looks real, like actual cat hair on a huge humanoid shape with the legs and arms of a man. Arms that were midway through swinging a baseball bat right at the worker's head. He ducks just in time, the dull wooden bat glancing off the bricks of a nearby building, narrowly missing the worker's head. As it bounces off the wall, the blunt weapon slips from the soggy gloves of the suit and clatters to the ground. The second he hears the wooden bat land on the ground, the worker turns his heel and runs again, taking advantage of those precious few seconds to get further distance between him and his attacker. It's only exactly as he turns his back that he wishes he'd reached for the bat himself to fight back. Rushing further down the rain-swept street, the worker can hear the heavy slumping footsteps of the suited attacker giving chase. He alternates between looking straight ahead, the raindrops streaming down his face and getting into his eyes, and daring to glance back over his shoulder. Every time he does, he's met again with the horrifying sight of the suit behind him. He wants nothing more than to escape, to get out of this nightmare wherein he is soaked head to toe in rainwater and fear, running for his life, from someone dressed as the comic strip cat he sees every day. But as strong as his will to escape is, he can't bear to let the first suited pursuer out of his sight for even a second. If he can't see it, then it might be anywhere. At least looking told him that he was still right behind him, bearing down on the worker with its bat now firmly back in hand. The shrill noise of chain links rattling sounds behind him as the attacker in the suit starts striking a nearby fence, making the worker more and more aware that with every strike, it's getting closer. Through the relentless downpour, the worker spots a shape standing on the sidewalk just a few feet ahead. Short, stationary, something he sees every day of his life but never pays any notice to. But tonight, it might just be the thing that saves his life. A trash can. It's full, and that means heavy. And any second now, he'll be close enough to reach it. A plan forms in seconds, erupting like a fire with gasoline thrown on it. If that gasoline was pure, terrified adrenaline of being chased by someone in an orange cat costume. Reaching out, as soon as his fingertips grip the wet metal rim of the can, the worker pulls as hard as possible, his instincts keeping him from stopping running. The trash can clatters behind him as he passes, followed by the heavy thud of the attacker falling to the ground as it trips over the obstacle and lands furry head first in the garbage now strewn over the sidewalk. The worker knows he's only got another short window, another blessing of a precious few seconds to get far enough away from his attacker. He turns, changing course to rush across the street. There's an old warehouse over there. If there are security guards working, they might be able to help. If not, and the place is unguarded, then at least it could be somewhere to hide. A sudden blaring noise pierces the worker's eardrums before he can make it all the way to the opposite sidewalk. It's a horn, coupled with a bright pair of lights appearing as if from nowhere. Then, before he can turn to see it coming, impact. First against the hood of the car, speeding through the rain towards him, unable to stop in enough time. Next, the pain of hitting the jagged blacktop of the road. The second impact, as the worker lands a few feet away, spots of rain still pattering against his face as everything goes from dark to pitch black for a few seconds. His head floods with scenes from earlier that day, as if his life was about to start flashing before his eyes, only in reverse. The news of the comic strip doing poorly arrives at the Paws Inc. office, and with it, the knowledge that, if there are going to be layoffs, then he'll be first. He's the new hire, after all. 
It didn't matter that the once beloved comic of a cartoon cat is losing its popularity, going stale after so many years in print. It upset the investors, and the worker has been worrying all day if he'd be the one fired to appease them, until he suddenly remembers what's coming after him. Fighting back and clawing his way back to consciousness, he struggles back to his feet, screaming with pain. He's injured, that much he can certainly tell, even if he doesn't know how badly. Hey, hey mister! The driver calls, stopping his car and starting to climb out of the vehicle. It's a different driver and car this time, and unlike the first, he makes the effort to stop, a mistake that is about to cost him greatly. He sees the worker getting back up, ignoring his calls. He raises his voice to cut through the noise of the pouring rain. Hey, you okay? I'm so sorry, I didn't see you. My lights were on low, wipers are going, it wasn't until you rushed out across the street that… Anyway, look, let me at least get you to a hospital. We can exchange our insurance information once they get you all patched up. The worker wasn't listening. He hears the driver's words but pays him no mind. He's still so intent on getting away that it takes him a second to realize. The car. It's a way out. And then, the worker makes the same mistake as the driver. He stops. And when he does, he sees what has clambered back to its fur-coated feet and is now shuffling towards the driver. Look out! The worker yells. The driver turns, just in time to see. What the hell? He exclaims. Wait a minute, why are you dressed in a Garfield costume? Whack! The sound of the bat being swung at the driver makes the worker feel sick. He turns his back and moves as quickly as he can towards the warehouse, despite the pain and the horrified screams coming from behind. Beneath the rain, there's something else. A twisted, vile squelching noise that quickly snuffs out the driver's dying cries. The worker doesn't dare to look back this time. He doesn't want to see what's happening. Lifting a heavy metal shutter and pulling it shut behind him, he finds himself in the warehouse. It's completely deserted. There isn't a single sign of life anywhere. The only sound is the pattering of rainwater against the hard concrete floor, dripping through a hole in the ceiling. Guided by the low, glowing light of the street lamps outside that bleeds through the warehouse windows, the worker starts fumbling around for a place to hide. Just as he crawls underneath a large pallet rack, he hears a metallic rattling as the fur-suited monstrosity lifts up the shutter. It's inside. With heavy, plodding steps in its suit, it paces up and down the aisles of discarded shelving. The worker clamps his soaked hands against his mouth, trying to mask his panicked breathing, only to let out a scream as he feels something grab his ankle and pull. With ease, the thing dressed as a disheveled Garfield pulls him out of his hiding place. Instinctively, the worker thrashes his legs, landing a solid kick to the creature. As his foot connects, he notices it doesn't feel like a person underneath the suit. There's no body, no familiar outline of a human being beneath all the soggy fur and stench. It's just a slimy mass. Nonetheless, the kick knocks the garish Garfield back, only a few paces, but better than nothing. He scrabbles to his feet, standing and running as fast as he can in the opposite direction, only to hit a wall at the far side of the warehouse. The shutter is the only way out, and right now it's wide open. But Garfield stands between the worker and freedom. He turns to dart down the next aisle, between the rows of shelves, keeping his eyes on the attacker as he passes underneath the hole in the ceiling. The rain is still coming down through it, leaving a puddle on the floor. The worker's focus is locked on the beast. He suddenly feels his foot slipping out from under him, that awful lurch of his heart as he falls. The puddle. He slipped on it and come crashing down to the ground. The force of the concrete striking his back knocks all the breath from his lungs. Everything is spinning in a nauseating mix of pain, disorientation, and terror. Above, through the unrepaired ceiling, drops of rain come pouring down on him. Then, a low, agonized meow from somewhere nearby. The monster, Garfield, brings its bat swinging down and sharply connecting with the worker lying on the ground. A new surge of pain racks his body, right at the hip where the baseball bat just landed in an unforgiving blow. The worker can do nothing but scream in pain and fear. A horrible sound, like something wet tearing, fills his ears over his own cries. He remembers the sickening feeling of a slimy mass being aggressively pushed into his face. It's disgusting, rancid, but even under all the horror and the repulsive taste, he can detect familiar hints. Pasta, beef, tomato sauce, cheese, all of it moldy and rotten but still recognizable. The monstrous SCP-3166 forces further fistfuls of lasagna down the worker's throat until the screaming stops. He'd always hated Mondays. Just a little further, your friend says. They're leading your group, and as you all emerge from the woods, your flashlight illuminates a tall chain-link fence with barbed wire strung across the top. How are you supposed to get over that? Another of your friends asks, and the group's leader has just the answer. 
they point their flashlight several yards down, where you see a large pine tree that has fallen over onto the fence, creating a bridge that you should be able to shimmy along to get over the barrier. You and your group of friends take turns climbing over the toppled tree before dropping down on the other side of the tall fence. After dusting yourselves off, your group walks further into the clearing until you come to an old set of railroad tracks that are rusty and look like they haven't been used in some time. Well, one of your more incredulous friends asks, what's supposed to happen? The group's leader explains that if we're lucky, we'll see it. See what? The ghost light. They go on to explain that on certain nights, a mysterious light will appear in this very clearing, wandering the area around the railroad tracks. What is it? You ask. Your friend tells you that many years ago, maybe a hundred or more, this was once a bustling and busy stretch of railroad. One night, a Union Pacific worker came out to check a portion of the tracks that were supposedly damaged. The worker went out into the night with his dim lantern, and he walked along the tracks until he stopped in this very clearing. He spotted what looked to be damage to one of the rails and bent down to examine it. No one knows why he didn't hear the train barreling towards him or hear its whistle cry out in the night, but the man would never hear anything again, as BAM! The train took his head clean off. Now, with only his lantern to guide him in the night, the headless railway worker wanders this clearing, still searching for his missing head. That's a stupid story, one of your friends says. How could someone not notice an entire train? I don't know, but it's true. No, it isn't. As the two go back and forth, you suddenly notice something in the distance. Um, hey, look over there. Everyone follows the direction you're pointing and sees it. A dim ball of light hanging in the air. See, your friend says. I told you it was true. He steps towards the ball of light, and as he does, it actually moves, drifting back at the same rate he comes forward, as if to maintain the exact same distance. When your friend takes a step back, the light moves just the same. Look, over there, you say. Another one. What's going on? Were these the ghosts of multiple headless rail workers, all searching for their missing craniums? This light is brighter than the other, though, and rather than maintaining a set distance from your group, it's slowly moving towards you. What do we do? One asks. I don't know, the leader says. I've never dealt with a ghost before. The light continues to move towards your group, and no one knows what to do. Frozen in fear, you watch as the light passes straight through you, and your friends start to scream as it is absorbed into your chest. Their cries become muffled, though, sounding to you as if they're underwater. Your hearing isn't the only thing that feels that way. Your whole body suddenly feels as though you're submerged in liquid. You can't breathe, and you thrash at the air, trying to swim, but nothing is there. You scream and choke and fall to the ground as the ball of light passes through you like you weren't even there, leaving you in the dirt gasping for breath. Your friends rush over to help you up, asking what happened, but there's no time to explain because two even bigger, brighter lights have appeared. You're terrified of what they might do to you, but before you can even think about running, a voice calls out from the darkness. Stop right there! The two big balls of light are headlights attached to the front of a black SUV, and a pair of angry-looking armed guards have just gotten out of it. The last thing you hear is one of the men say, I can't believe we have to deal with this, before you feel the sting of a dart hitting your thigh and your vision goes black. You open your eyes to find that you're sitting in your own car with your group of friends. They too appear to have been asleep and are just waking. You're parked on the side of the road next to a thick forest of pine trees, and the sun is just starting to rise. What were we supposed to do again? One of your friends asks from the back seat. I don't remember, you say, but the sun's coming up. Let's get out of here. And you drive your group of friends back home with no memory of the previous night's events. This group of teens was quite lucky. What they thought was little more than an urban legend known as the Gurdon Lights was actually a mysterious and dangerous anomaly which the SCP Foundation knows much better as SCP-2640. SCP-2640 is a temporal anomaly that is found within a 5,000 square meter area near the town of Gurdon, Arkansas. The area is densely covered with pine trees, with the only man-made object found within it being a set of railroad tracks that bisect the area. Of most interest within SCP-2640, though, are the strange entities that manifest inside. Designated as SCP-2640-1, these entities are floating orbs of light that are capable of appearing alone or in groups, though no more than 12 at once have ever been observed manifesting at the same time. Their light will vary in intensity, from 75 to 450 lux, which is roughly equivalent to the range of light produced by standard light bulbs, and the color is always a bluish-white. 
The lights will normally be seen to travel slowly within SCP-2640, though they have been observed moving quite quickly on occasion, with the quickest ones having been measured traveling at speeds of up to 60 kilometers per hour. There is also a connection between the luminosity of the entities and their behavior. Those measured at less than 150 lux will not interact with humans, instead maintaining a distance of at least 20 meters from the nearest observer at all times. Attempts to move closer will lead to the entity moving away at the same rate, ensuring that it maintains the same 20 meters of distance at all times. On the opposite end of the scale, those that are closer to 450 lux are very active and will approach and even interact with humans. In some instances, the brighter SCP-2640-1 entities will actually pass through solid objects, including people, which leads to a very strange sensation for the person involved. When this has occurred, the subject has described a sensation of being suspended in liquid or floating in a swimming pool, despite there being no outward physical changes to them. This feeling of being in water will start the moment a 2640-1 entity makes contact with their body and will cease once it is no longer touching them. The SCP-2640-1 entities appear bound to the SCP-2640 area, and any that approach the boundaries will slowly dim until they disappear completely. In order to better understand the nature of SCP-2640, and specifically the 2640-1 entities found within, an expedition into the area using D-Class personnel was authorized. The three Class Ds were equipped with special equipment capable of measuring the relative reality distortion in a given area, and told to follow along the railroad tracks that run within SCP-2640, with orders to report anything they experienced that was out of the ordinary. As they progressed deeper into SCP-2640, their equipment detected significant reality distorting effects, and just as they did, the SCP-2640-1 entities began appearing. Despite being quite scared of what they perceived as ghosts, the Class D personnel were under strict orders not to run. A 2640-1 that was on the brighter end of the scale approached one of the D-Classes and passed through his body, leading him to experiencing the sensation of being underwater and, since he was unable to swim, made him believe that he might drown. The entity passed harmlessly through him and he was left with no lasting injuries, at least not any physical ones. After this test, and given the extremely high reality distorting effects that were detected in the area, it was theorized by researcher Dr. Connors that SCP-2640 might be one of the strongest temporal anomalies on the planet. His report goes on to hypothesize that SCP-2640-1 are actually life forms from another time period that we can see visually, due to this anomaly, yet cannot interact with lest we cause irreparable damage to the time-space continuum. Dr. Connors also noted that the area of SCP-2640 appeared to be slowly growing and in order to prevent further spread, the installation of several Zyank Anastasikos constant temporal sinks, or exacts, was authorized. And it was a good thing that the exacts were installed, because there was soon an incident that would prove how necessary they are. In a debriefing after said event with Tony Hargrove, a level 3 tech support staff, the SCP Foundation learned a horrifying reality about the true nature of SCP-2640. Mr. Hargrove explained that he was sent into SCP-2640 in order to assess the damage to the Foundation assets after a major tornado had passed through the area. He explained that while power was still running to the site, one of the exacts had been damaged and needed to be replaced, so a maintenance team was sent to install a spare that was kept on site. As the maintenance team approached the area where the exacts was no longer functioning, they reported that there were numerous 2640-1 instances out, more than they had ever seen before and a higher concentration of the brighter instances than usual. Soon after they reported this, Hargrove lost contact with the maintenance team and decided to go investigate himself. As he entered the SCP-2640 area, he saw something that he had never seen before. There weren't just a few more instances of 2640-1s than normal, but hundreds, maybe even thousands, floating all around him. There were so many that they lit up the sky to the point where he didn't even need a flashlight. Hargrove followed the same railroad tracks that the maintenance team had, and after walking several hundred meters, he spotted something in the mud next to the tracks. It was the replacement temporal sink that they were supposed to be installing, and there was blood on it. He realized that there wasn't just blood on the machine, but it was everywhere, covering the ground all around him. Then he saw something else, an SCP-2640-1 instance near him, but different somehow. I can't remember how I first saw it, he said. Right behind the orbs, there was this spot where the rain just wasn't. Like it was bending around some invisible mass, some, some great thing behind each orb. And once I saw it, I 
couldn't unsee it. Hargrove tried to step back away from the creature and fell into a ditch next to the tracks, clutching the exacts in his arms as the creature seemed to swim towards him. As he lay as still as he could in the ditch, he got the sense that this 2640-1 instance wasn't just randomly moving towards him, it was looking for him. As the void where the rain ceased to be swam over him through the air, he attempted to lie as still as he could, still holding tightly to the exacts. The SCP-2640-1 instance turned and circled over him, like a shark searching for its prey in a cloud of blood, before gliding away into the trees. At that moment, Hargrove knew that the SCP-2640-1 entities weren't what the Foundation thought they were. These weren't just beautiful balls of light that danced and played in the darkness. They were something else. Something horrible. Something dangerous. He knew that his maintenance team would never be found, and that the ditch he was lying in that was slowly filling with rainwater was mixed with their blood. The SCP-2640-1s were hunting them, and they never had any idea. Hargrove knew what he had to do. He crawled through the ditch, stopping any time a 2640-1 got near to him, holding his breath until long after it passed. It took hours of inching along on his belly in the water and mud until he finally reached the point where the damage exacts was located. He managed to get the new temporal sink online, and as it powered on, he watched as the 2640-1 lights around him slowly started to fade and then disappear once again. The deaths of the four Foundation personnel who were on the maintenance team, as well as six other civilians who were killed, were attributed to the tornado, and Mr. Hargrove requested that he be administered a Class B amnestic and reassigned to a new location, both of which are pending approval. The rail line that runs into SCP-2640 has been decommissioned, and a three-meter-tall electrified fence has been erected around the entirety of the area in order to prevent civilians from approaching. No fewer than eight Zyank and Estikos constant temporal sinks are placed in the surrounding area in order to prevent the further spread of SCP-2640, and a subterranean miniaturized pressurized water reactor has been installed on-site in order to provide constant, uninterrupted power. The Disinformation Bureau has an ongoing dissemination campaign to further the notion that the SCP-2640-1 lights are nothing more than an urban legend, and should any civilians manage to witness them, they are administered Class B amnestics in order to keep this Euclid-class anomaly a secret. Just what is the true nature of SCP-2640, and perhaps more importantly, SCP-2640-1? Is the breach of our reality a look into the past when this area was covered by an ancient ocean? or a glimpse into the future, when the seas have swallowed it once again. No matter which is the answer, the reality is that there is something there now, something that has managed to pierce the veil of time and make us its prey. Two recreational divers are swimming along the seafloor nearly a hundred feet below the surface. This husband and wife duo are no strangers to scuba diving, and they move effortlessly through the water as they marvel at the various fish and plant life that normally remain unseen by humans. The woman taps her husband on the shoulder and points in the direction of a forest of kelp before starting to swim towards it. The man is about to follow when he sees something out of the corner of his eye. He stops and turns to get a better look. A few dozen meters away is a group of people. The man is confused. He looks back towards his wife, who is motioning for him to follow her. He raises a single finger as if to say, I'll be with you in a minute, and starts to swim in the direction of the strange crowd of people standing on the seafloor. He still can't make out exactly what he's looking at. A light current is causing silt to kick up and hang in the air, obscuring his view. As he gets closer though, everything becomes clear. It really is a group of people, standing perfectly still, 30 meters underwater. But they aren't living people, of course. They are statues. The man can see now that these are statues of children. They are standing in a circle, facing outwards, and each one is holding hands with the statues next to them, forming an unbroken ring. He swims closer to get a better look. The statues are covered in algae and other plant life. He doesn't know who or why someone would make this strange art piece, but whatever their reasons, it looks like it's been down here a long time. He swims around the circle and counts more than 20 in total, with each one looking to be unique. While the center of the circle of statues is empty, there's pieces of bricks and concrete scattered all around it. There used to be something down here, a building or some kind of structure that once housed the statues and has now collapsed. It seems impossible that anything could have ever been built down here. He looks back in the direction of his wife, but he can't see her. She must be somewhere along the kelp investigating her own mysteries. He's about to head in her direction when he notices something. The inside of the circle isn't empty. 
Something is inside, sticking out of the sand. He swims up above the ring to get a better look. There's definitely something buried in the circle of statues. He can see now that it is the corner of what looks to be a metal box. He swims down closer to the box and reaches a hand out towards it, when he suddenly stops and looks up. The woman swims out of the dense kelp forest carrying a brightly colored shell. She can't wait to show her husband how beautiful it is. She looks around, but there's no sign of him. She looks in the direction that he swam and spots the same strange group of people that he did. As she swims towards them, she also quickly realizes that these are just statues. Very odd ones, but statues nonetheless. She also notices the rubble that surrounds them. The broken chunks of concrete, bricks, some bones… wait, bones? That's when she spots something else lying on the ocean floor just outside the ring of statues. It's her husband's scuba tank, with his shattered mask resting on top. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-1451, also known as Sunken Children's Perimeter. SCP-1451 is the designation that has been given to an anomalous set of metal statues that possess very strange and deadly properties. The 26 statues, each of which is unique and have been given the designations SCP-1451-1 through 26, all resemble human children and range in height from 1.32 to 1.43 meters. They are located within an ocean inlet on the seafloor and are arranged in a circle facing outwards, with each holding hands with the ones next to it, forming an unbroken ring. These statues are anything but stationary though, at least some of the time, and in fact they have three distinct stages of motion, which the SCP Foundation refers to as Class 1 through 3 scenarios. The first, a Class 1 scenario is the designation given when no movement is detected at all. This is the state that the statues appear to spend the majority of their time in. The designation will change to Class 2 when some slight movement of the statues is detected. In this state, they can be seen to slowly raise and lower their hands, while also subtly moving together in a counterclockwise direction. Bubbles have been observed coming from the statues' mouths during this scenario. SCP-1451 will be seen to behave this way when a large object comes near it and it will often mean that the statues are preparing to transition into a Class 3 scenario. A Class 3 scenario will be triggered when a solid object that weighs more than 40 grams enters the center of the circle. When the object, whether it be a living one or not, enters this activation area, the statues will fully animate and turn their attention on the object with only one purpose, to destroy it. When the statues enter a Class 3 scenario, they exhibit incredible strength and agility. They appear to possess at least a rudimentary form of intelligence as well, as they have been seen utilizing teamwork and advanced tactics. Once the statues have been activated, they are relentless in the pursuit of their targets, stopping at nothing to neutralize them. Should you manage to make it out of the activation area, the statues will still continue to give chase, and in one case, they followed a target over a kilometer before finally overtaking it. Once they get their hands on a target, death and destruction are all but assured. They will rip and tear anything that enters their circle apart, be it man or machine, with their metallic hands. Once they have eliminated the object, the statues will then return to their Class 1 scenario position. Attempts to intercept the statues as they return to their activation area will lead to what the Foundation has dubbed a Class 3.5 scenario, during which they will destroy anyone or anything that tries to intervene or prevent them from reaching their destination. While SCP-1451 might seem to be one of the simpler anomalies in the SCP Foundation database, there may just be more to this story than first meets the eye. And in fact, the sunken children's perimeter may not even be the first anomaly that was contained here. Those with Foundation Overseer level clearance have access to some rather interesting documents that help to fill in just what SCP-1451 might really be, and more importantly, what they're protecting. The documents include a manifest of the materials that were initially recovered from the area where SCP-1451 was discovered. These materials included roughly 20 kilograms of bricks, 4,000 kilograms of containment-grade concrete, the type normally used in SCP Foundation sites, and most interesting of all, a damaged Scranton box. For those unaware, Scranton boxes were the precursors to Dr. Scranton's much better known reality anchors. These powerful devices are used to contain reality-warping anomalies and prevent them from bending the fabric of our universe to their whims. Dr. Scranton's initial research into the technology produced an early version that was used in the containment of anomalies, though we now know 
that the technology was flawed and could lead to failures in containment. In the case of SCP-1451, a document was partially recovered from the Scranton box that alludes to just such a failure. In this instance, a powerful Euclid-class reality warper was being held at Area 56, a location that the Foundation has no record of ever having existed. The corrupted file seems to suggest that the reality warping SCP's primary anomalous attribute was that things it believed to be real would become real. If it misconceived reality in any way, its anomalous abilities would force that misconception to become actual reality. For example, after the anomalous entity referred to an agent assigned to its containment as a child, the agent was at risk of undergoing various physical and mental changes to truly become a child. It appears that the anomaly may have begun conflating various aspects of its containment, mixing up the concepts of containment itself. The metal of its cage, the concrete of its cell, the child agent involved with its containment, the SCP Foundation itself, they all became entangled within the reality warping anomaly's mind and appear to have been jumbled together in such a way that led to the creation of SCP-1451. A group of metal children who are eternally on guard and destroy anything that tries to breach their perimeter. Just what happened to Area 56, the personnel who were stationed there, or the powerful reality warping anomaly they contained, continues to be a mystery. SCP-1451 has been classified as Euclid and is considered to be effectively contained at its current location. A sphere of wire mesh netting has been erected around it in order to ensure that no objects enter its activation area, but in the event that an object does manage to enter the circle, the statues are to be remotely monitored and no attempts whatsoever are to be made to try and rescue the person or object that triggered the Class 3 scenario. A young man and his girlfriend enter the apartment they share. She tosses her keys on the entryway table as the man checks the time on his phone. He reminds the young woman that they will need to leave soon if they don't want to miss the movie they have purchased tickets for. The woman agrees, but she wants to take a quick shower before they leave. As she goes to freshen up, the man sits down at his computer to get in a quick round or two of his favorite online squad-based first-person shooter. He puts on his headset and jumps into a game. Before he knows it, he's just finished his third round. He checks the time on his phone again and realizes that they were running late. He takes off his headphones and is confused when he hears what sounds like the shower still running. He gets up and goes to the bathroom door and listens. The shower is definitely still on. The man knocks on the door and asks if everything is alright. He waits a moment, but there's no response. He knocks again, and still, nothing. She doesn't usually take showers this long, and he immediately worries that she might have passed out or… well, he doesn't even want to think about it. I'm coming in, okay? He announces as he opens the door to check on her. The man immediately notices how steamy the room is. The hot water must have been running for a while, and he's worried she really did pass out from the heat. What's going on, are you okay? He asks, and when there's no response again, he pulls open the shower curtain to find… nothing. Just an empty tub. There's no sign of his girlfriend anywhere. The man is beyond confused. He turns off the water and goes to the bedroom, but she isn't in there either. He runs to the front door, but it's still locked, and her keys are sitting on the table. He unlocks the door and sticks his head out into the hallway anyway, but nothing is out there. What is going on? He checks the bedroom again, then the bathroom, but she hasn't suddenly reappeared in either. He's in complete shock, unsure of what could be happening. He sits down on the toilet and puts his head in his hands. His head is spinning as it feels like the world is suddenly falling down all around him. The police are immediately suspicious of the man's story. His girlfriend simply vanished while taking a shower? You expect us to believe that? The detective asks. The man has no answer, though. It's as if she simply blinked out of existence. He's convinced she must still be in the building somewhere, that she somehow slipped out without him noticing but none of the security footage from inside the building shows anything abnormal. There's footage from the cameras in the lobby of them entering the building, but nothing after that of her leaving. Just as in every missing person case like this, the boyfriend is the number one suspect, but without any evidence, they can't hold him any longer. After many long hours of interviews, they finally allow him to leave, but not back to the apartment, since it's an active crime scene. The man has no family to speak of, and his few friends seem to have the same suspicions as the police and want nothing to do with him. His girlfriend was the only person he truly had in the world, and now she's gone. He's put up in a shabby motel, and days pass, then weeks, then months, but no evidence of the missing woman ever turns up. The man replays the memory of that day over and over in his head, searching for some kind of answer, but try as he might, he can't remember anything helpful. No clue as to what could have happened. 
The case is completely cold, and has been from the very start. The police eventually have to move on to newer, more solvable cases, and they finally allow the man to return home. He's overwhelmed with emotion the first time he enters the apartment. The place is a mess. It looks like the police turned it inside out looking for clues. Not knowing what else to do, he starts the long process of cleaning up the apartment. After hours of putting things away, he eventually gathers the strength to go to the one room he's been avoiding, the bathroom. He opens the door to the last place he's certain his girlfriend was. He enters to find that it looks like the rest of the apartment, as if someone has looked at every single object. But just like him, the police never found any trace of where she went. After straightening up this last room, he decides that he should take a shower and go to bed. It fills him with dread to think about standing in the last place he knows where she was. But he's had months to grieve the loss of his girlfriend, and he's decided that he needs to move on, whatever that means when someone goes missing without a trace. He turns on the shower and lets the water heat up before stepping in. Once he's in, every thought he has is about her. He wonders if she ever actually got in the shower at all, or somehow used it as a diversion to slip out unseen. He just can't figure out how. The day's events race through his mind, just as they have a thousand times before, but his thoughts are interrupted when he notices that the water has started to pool around his feet. He looks down and sees that the drain cover looks normal. Maybe there's a clog, though. Do showers clog when they're not used? He has no idea. He bends down to get a closer look. The long black creature emerges from the drain in the blink of an eye and latches onto his mouth, muffling him before he even has a chance to scream. He struggles and pulls down the curtain on top of him as he falls back onto the shower floor. But it's already too late, and in a matter of minutes, he too will be gone without a trace. Is there anything more comforting after a hard day than a nice long hot shower? The answer to that is no, there is nothing better. But that relaxing shower might just be the last you ever take when unbeknownst to you, your pipes are home to an instance of SCP-153, also known as drain worms. SCP-153 refers to a species that resembles the common nematode, or roundworm, consisting of a long, thin body with a large mouth on one end. While some roundworms can grow to as large as a meter long, which is in itself a disturbing thought, SCP-153 instances can be much, much larger, and it is estimated that they can reach up to nearly 10 meters in length, though it is hypothesized that some instances in the wild may grow even longer. These worm-like creatures will feed off of any available organic material, however, their favorite form of sustenance is fresh animal tissue, and they appear to have an especially strong predilection towards human flesh. In order to satiate their desire to feed on their preferred prey, SCP-153 has developed a rather unique predatory style that perfectly suits its elongated body structure. While it is unknown just where they originate, they are most often found in the pipes of sewer and drainage systems. 153 instances will swim up those pipes, seeking out ones that lead to people's homes, and especially those that connect to showers and bathtubs. Once they reach the end of the pipe, SCP-153 will latch onto the drain cover and begin secreting an acidic substance. The acid quickly dissolves the drain cover, and SCP-153 will position its own mouth in its place, which it then is able to camouflage as the missing drain cover almost perfectly. Once SCP-153 has taken this position, it is virtually impossible to distinguish it from the original or discern that anything has changed. SCP-153 will then lie in wait until it detects that someone has entered the shower or bathtub. Once the unsuspecting person has begun to bathe, it will very quickly emerge from the drain latching onto the victim's face, most likely in order to prevent them from calling for help. It then begins to rapidly secrete more of the same acid that it used to dissolve the drain cover. With how effectively it was able to dissolve metal, it's no surprise that SCP-153 is able to quickly produce the same effect on its victim. Their skin, muscle, and bone will all be almost immediately liquefied, allowing SCP-153 to feed on the slurry, and the drain worms feed extremely quickly as well. After just several minutes, basically nothing will remain of the person who stepped into the shower, and 153 will retreat back into the drain, leaving no signs that it was ever there, save for the missing drain cover. The SCP Foundation became aware of this anomaly following multiple mysterious missing person cases that all had one key element in common. Each was reported as having disappeared after entering a bathroom to either shower or take a bath. The Foundation soon discovered that large populations of SCP-153 instances were living in the sewers beneath several major American cities, and immediately began enacting containment procedures. 
the Foundation collected as many specimens as they could and brought them to Bio Research Area 12, where they keep them contained in 10 by 10 by 5 meter tanks that are kept partially filled with sewage and other organic material for them to feed on. Of course, it is of the utmost importance that these containers are never connected to any other plumbing systems, either internal or external. With several specimens contained, the Foundation began researching the creatures in order to hopefully better understand them and how they were able to develop such complex hunting techniques. Research was also approved to find out whether they could be used as a sort of waste disposal system in certain extreme circumstances, such as with SCP-2717, a mass of living animal tissue that has grown to line nearly four kilometers of sewer pipes beneath Amsterdam. A small number of SCP-153 instances were approved for release into the wild in order to test whether they could stall the spread of 2717. However, this experiment was halted following some disturbing new reports. More missing person reports came to the Foundation's attention that bore the hallmarks of an SCP-153 attack. But these new reports were not limited to people who vanished after bathing. It now appears that SCP-153 has further adapted and has begun to emerge not just from showers and bathtub drains, but now also from sinks and, yes, even toilets. The Foundation is unaware of just how many instances of SCP-153 continue to exist in the wild, but there's no doubt that many continue to live and hunt undetected in sewers around the world. This anomaly, which has been classified as Euclid, is taken very seriously by the Foundation, and any reports of people who go missing from bathrooms are immediately investigated for signs of SCP-153. Field agents are to be equipped with infrared and ultraviolet sensors which can bypass SCP-153's camouflage, and if specimens are able to be captured alive, then they are to be brought to Area 12 for further research. But don't bother worrying too much the next time you step into the tub. If you've been targeted by SCP-153, there's not much you'll be able to do anyway, and your worries will soon be going down the drain, along with whatever remains of you. It's never a nice feeling waking up lying amongst shards of broken glass in the middle of the road. The dawn sky above the biker looks almost peaceful. It's as if nothing had gone wrong at all, as if everything is right in the world. But slowly, the throbbing pain washes into his helmeted head, and the sound of the traffic surrounding him rises in his ears. A sea of onlookers gathers around as the cars blast their horns. Through the cracked visor of his helmet, the biker can see concerned faces, people calling emergency services, and a few women crying. His paramedic bike is toppled on its side about 40 feet from him. There are long black tire marks running up to where it lies, smoking slightly on its side. With a groan, the biker sits himself up and shakes his head. Bad idea. Looking around though, it seems he's the only one injured. His bike had gone into the front of a car at the junction. The occupants of the car stand by nervously, offering him whatever little assistance they can. But there's no time for that, the biker suddenly realizes. He looks down at his watch frantically. It's 12.03 p.m. There's not enough time. He rushes over to the bike as fast as he can and lifts it back upright. A couple of onlookers try to grab his arms, trying to sit down to rest, but he can't. There's no time. He has just three minutes to get to St. Mary's Hospital in central London. Right now, he's at the junction outside Baker Street Station. He can still make it on time if he gets on his bike and goes now. The biker swings his leg onto the bike and kicks it into life. He takes a deep gulp and looks over his shoulder at the box on the back of his bike. He can't risk opening it here. The damage may already be done. But if the heart is still alive in that box, it is the only chance that a 10-year-old boy has for a normal life. If he doesn't get to the hospital in the next three minutes, his life could be over. The school children stand in a circle, looking down at the dead bird with a morbid fascination. Do you think it's alive? No, no way. The boy in the middle of the group goes to pick up a stick. With an air of false confidence, he walks up to the bird and gives it a prod. It makes a squelching noise. The other kids all reel in shock, making retching noises and laughing about it. It's only when their teacher comes out to call them inside that the group disperses, leaving the animal carcass alone, sitting at the edge of the playground, outside the view of boring adults. Each passing day, the kids wander over to the bird's body. It's kind of the best biology lesson they've ever had as they watch the animal slowly decompose. At first, its body just shrinks, goes flat almost. The feathers start falling out and it loses all of its color. Then it starts to get puffy. Different parts of its flesh bulge out in weird places, as if they're being inflated like a balloon animal at someone's birthday party. But then, the maggots come. 
There are only a couple of tiny white crawling wrigglers in the bird's body at first, but a couple of days after that, it's infested with them. The creepy crawlies wriggle all over the body. But as the boy looks down at the dead bird, he spots something very peculiar, something they haven't seen in a biology class before. There's a red maggot, wriggling and crawling in amongst the rest of the creepy crawlies. It squirms like the rest of them, but even over the course of the school day, it quickly grows larger than any of the others. What do you think it is? The boy stares at it. It looks like a worm. And a worm is exactly what it was. The next day, when the kids return, they see that the red maggot is now much larger than any of the others feasting on the bird. With a slightly translucent body, cherry red coloring, and small white speckles on its skin, it looks unlike anything they've ever seen before. Actually, not unlike anything they've ever seen before, it looks exactly like something that all the kids recognize very well. In fact, one of the kids has a bag of them right now that he's chewing on. A candied worm. The kids stare in curiosity, first at the bag of candy that their friend has in his hand, and then down at the worm, slowly eating its way through the decomposing bird. As far as their eyes can tell, the two things are exactly the same. Except, of course, that the one eating the bird seems to be alive. Kids being kids, the next thing that happened was sort of inevitable. One dares the boy to eat it. He almost wretches in disgust. There's no way he's even touching it. And then, another one of the children throws down the poison chalice and dares him. The boy stands there nervously. He knows that he's not allowed to eat worms. That had been a lesson ingrained in him from a very young age. But his mother isn't here right now. And this thing doesn't look like any kind of worm that he's seen before. It almost looks a bit… tasty. In exchange for eating the worm, another one of the children promises he'll give him five English pounds. The kids around the circle gasp. That's a lot of money. None of them have even got two pounds on them, let alone five. Think of all the sweets you could buy with that kind of money. But the boy is adamant. He puffs his chest out, he stands up tall, and he nods firmly. Five pounds, or he wouldn't do it. After some intense schoolyard debate, the deal is sealed. As the boy lies in bed that night, staring at the ceiling and grumbling, he knows that he is not happy about what his friends have done to him today. He's going to get them back for this. Only he's getting a bit of a tummy ache. Getting is the wrong word. He's had a tummy ache for most of the evening. What he's experiencing now is heartburn. It feels as if something is crawling in his chest. The boy just ignores it. It's probably just his worries about the worm inside of him. He chewed it up pretty well. There's no way that it's still alive in him, surely. His uneasy sleep is punctuated by rotten dreams. Dreams in which he finds himself lying on the floor and his playground lying on the ground at school, unable to move as people gather around him to poke him with a stick. He feels his skin covered with maggots. They even crawl across the surface of his eyes. In his chest, there's a searing pain. The boy wakes with a start as he feels his heart pounding, thudding against his ribs. It's agonizing. Adrenaline courses through him as he sweats off his face. Crying out for his mom, the boy lies there in bed, feeling the heart attacking his system. When you decide to become a surgeon, you have to accept that you're not going to get very much sleep most nights. In fact, it's more than that. You have to not only accept that you won't get much sleep most nights, but you also have to be at your absolute best when you've had no sleep and it's the middle of the night. With over 40 years under his belt, the surgeon doesn't need coffee anymore, even when the junior doctor offers it to him as he strides toward the operating theater. Instead, he asks them to fill him in on the situation. Who's his patient? What's going on? What needs to be done? The doctor accompanying him reads the notes in a calm but hurried voice. They haven't got much time on this one at all. At any moment, the boy's heart could give out. The surgeon asks what's wrong with the organ, and the doctor looks at his notes in apparent confusion. Apparently, over the course of the night, the boy has suffered a 72% reduction in the mass of his heart. The surgeon stops just on the other side of the door. He doesn't want to have this conversation in front of his whole team. He whispers to the doctor in a terse voice, What kind of infection does this boy have that his heart has undergone that rapid of a deterioration? It's not an infection at all, sir. It's… well, sir, it's a worm. The doctor holds out a sheet to him. The surgeon takes it from him. He looks down at the x-ray to see a scan of the boy's chest cavity. It doesn't look so bad. There's a hole in the heart for sure, but the surgeon has encountered worse in his career. This was taken when the boy was first admitted. The doctor hands the surgeon a second x-ray. And this was taken just one hour later. 
It is barely recognizable as a human heart. There seems to be a mass growing in the cavity that was left by the heart. And there, infecting all of the boy's organs, was the shape of a worm. The biker weaves his way through the traffic down on Marylebone Road, eyes darting frantically in all directions. He may have a concussion, and he may not be allowed to drive at all right now. In fact, he knows he definitely isn't. But he is under strict instructions. This heart needs to get to St. Mary's Hospital before it's too late. The bike careens around the corner and skids to a halt outside the emergency doors. An ambulance team in front of him is trying to help an old lady out of the back of their vehicle, but the biker doesn't have time for them. He grabs the organ box from the back of the bike and races into the building. It takes all of his remaining concentration to navigate through the maze of hospital corridors on his way to the operating theater. On a better day, he'd be able to do this with no problem, but with his head injury, he can see the lights starting to blur all around him. Ward 6, Ward 7, Ward 7A, Ward 7B, he runs as fast as his heavy boots will allow him, feeling that energy draining from his system. He can't look at his watch, he can't check the time, he just has to find this boy. Operating theater, there, right up ahead of him, just a couple of hundred feet. There's a doctor waiting outside the door who looks up at the sound of his footsteps. The biker rips his helmet off and holds out the box with a heart in it, panting heavily. It's the moment of truth. Is he too late? The doctor looks shell-shocked, not at the biker's arrival, but clearly at something else she's just seen. The man starts to explain, but runs out of words, and instead beckons the biker to follow him into the observation room. There, the two of them stand looking through the glass at the little boy lying on the operating table with the surgeon standing over him. There's something in the air. The biker sniffs, confused. Can anyone else smell sugar? Next time you open a packet of candied worms, take a second to look through the little creepy crawlies in the bag. Perhaps poke a couple of them, just to see if any of them are moving. You can never be too careful. If you had told the parents of that young boy on the night when their son woke up with heart palpitations, telling stories of eating a worm at school, that the only health concerns he would have going forward were mild diabetes and a slightly raised level of blood sugar, I'm sure they would have been thrilled to hear it. You see, SCP-839, commonly referred to within the Foundation as candied worms, is much scarier on the surface than it is underneath. Not only does this SCP resemble your usual candy worm, but its body is actually composed of sugar flavorings and colorings, roughly equivalent to what you would find in most convenience store candy aisles. Each instance even has a small raised bit of writing near the tail specifying which flavor it is. While the origins of these worms are yet to be determined, cases have sprung up across much of the Western world, with higher numbers reported in areas with higher levels of diabetes. There seems to be a parallel between high sugar diets and the presence of SCP-839. Whether they are of man-made or other origins is yet to be determined. That is not to say that SCP-839 cannot survive outside of human populations. This SCP in the wild primarily feeds on decomposing organic matter and is capable of sustaining itself on a purely vegetarian diet. However, when ingested into the human body, SCP-839 will target specific organs and burrow its way towards them. The organ in question depends on which color candied worm the SCP instance is. For example, the red cherry flavored candied worms will burrow towards the heart and consume that, while the blue raspberry ones will instead feed on the human's kidney. One would expect the health consequences of this feeding to be severe. However, as the SCP feeds, it will also change its own shape and chemical composition until the worm itself becomes a substitute organ for the one that it is consuming. However, this substitute organ is not a perfect replacement, as other health consequences are derived from its presence. For example, the green apple-flavored SCP-839-3 targets the eye and replaces it with a jelly-green version of the human eye. While this eye is mostly capable of sight, subjects have reported mild hallucinations and blurriness of vision, as well as a greenish tint to how they see the world. Fortunately for the Foundation, SCP-839 reproduces sexually, meaning that individual instances require a partner in order to have offspring. This has made containment of this SCP much more feasible. Though they are a relatively low-priority entity in the broader scope of the Foundation, there are no known cases as of yet of any SCP-839 infections leading to death or serious chronic illness. Therefore, any instances that are captured by the Foundation are sent to Storage Site 839-1, where they are kept in a glass housing and regularly fed a diet of plant matter each day. Here, their reproductive activity can be closely monitored and controlled based on what research is needed. 
Those infected with SCP-839 instances can continue to live long and healthy lives, with only minor health complications arising. Therefore, the Foundation is comfortable allowing a reasonable number of cases to go unexamined in the world. So, like I said, for next time you open up a bag of candied worms, maybe just give them a quick poke. You could be saving yourself a trip to the hospital and a lifetime dependence on insulin. At first glance, it looks like a perfectly ordinary bathroom. Nothing to suggest that anything weird is going on here. Certainly, if the D-Class personnel assigned to investigate this facility had encountered this room in the wild, if you walked into a bathroom that looked like this while visiting a friend's house or lunching in a restaurant or even stopping at a gas station rest stop, you wouldn't have any reason to think anything was amiss. But this is the SCP Foundation, so he knows that nothing here is as it seems. He glances briefly up at the camera installed in the ceiling. The lens aperture dilates briefly, focusing on his face, and he knows that an SCP technical on the other end is watching his every move. He grimaces, fully aware that his status as a member of D-Class personnel means that every experiment could be his last. That knowledge doesn't exactly endear him to the Foundation or its mission, but it's not like he has much of a choice in picking his assignments. Suddenly, a voice crackles to life over the intercom. Please step fully into the bathroom, says the researcher on the other end of the camera feed. What's this all about? asks the D-Class personnel. This is just a bathroom, isn't it? What's so special about this place? His eyes scan the room. The floor is covered with smooth white tiles. The walls are a soothing light blue color, reminiscent of a calm ocean, the sort of color that you might pick for its soothing effect when you need to make use of these facilities. A large mirror is fixed to the wall before a countertop with a sink. Next to the sink, there's a toilet, and next to that, a bathtub with a shower. There's a scrubbing brush and a plunger stashed behind the toilet tank, and a fuzzy shag cover stretched over the toilet lid. It's all very ordinary. It's much too ordinary, he thinks. A sudden horrible thought occurs to him. You're not going to watch me use the toilet, he asks, a slight edge of panic in his voice. That's absurd, of course, but here at the SCP Foundation, there's nothing that he would put past these people. They've always got some new weirdness happening, and it wouldn't at all surprise him to learn that they would want to watch him at his most exposed. The voice comes back over the intercom. What? No, you don't need to use the... Look, just step forward. Literally all that I want you to do is to step into the room. The D-Class smirks to himself. He's already been through more of these crazy experiments than he would care to remember, and he has the scars to prove it. It gives him a small measure of satisfaction to hear the agent getting flustered. Even if he has to participate in these dangerous experiments, he can at least make things awkward for his tormentors. That seems like a little bit of poetic justice to him. As the agent requested, though, he steps forward. The moment that he's cleared the threshold, the door slams behind him with a crash. The D-Class jumps in surprise and shouts, What the? Why'd you do that? I didn't do that, says the voice over the intercom. Of course, thinks the D-Class personnel. He should have expected this. He grabs the doorknob and tries to yank the door open, but the door is stuck fast. He yanks again, harder this time, but the result is the same. The door doesn't budge at all. The door's stuck, cries the D-Class. He feels his heart start to beat faster, and his temperature begins to rise. What terrible thing does this room plan to do to him? But after a moment, he begins to calm down. It doesn't seem like this room is planning to do anything. Maybe it's just a room with a weird door. But if that were the case, then why would the SCP Foundation be interested in this? Just hang tight, says the agent. I'll see what I can do about getting that door open. A few moments later, the agent arrives at the door to the bathroom and gives it a sharp yank. It doesn't budge. Door's stuck she says. The D-Class rolls his eyes. Of course it's stuck. Hold on a second, I'll go get a technician, she says. The D-Class personnel listens to the sound of the agent's feet retreating into the distance. He sits down on the closed toilet and buries his face in his hands. What a day. Is he going to be trapped inside this bathroom forever? He can't help but speculate, but he tries not to think about it. He's more annoyed than anything, truth be told. He wonders if the agent is actually going for help or if she's still just sitting in her cubicle, watching him through the camera and waiting for the other shoe to drop. His eyes flick to the camera, and he furrows his brow. He's so intent on the camera that he doesn't notice as a dark shape slowly bubbles out from the bathtub drain. It's a cockroach, a perfectly ordinary cockroach. Or is it? The roach remains motionless for a moment, perfectly still, except for the subtle twitch of its antenna. Then, all at once, it starts to move. The roach scuttles across the tub, scaling the porcelain walls, and runs across the counter. Like all cockroaches, it seems confused now that it's emerged into the light and eager to find a dark corner where it can hide again. 
It reaches the edge of the countertop, but, of course, a sheer cliff is no obstacle for an insect. It shimmies down the cabinet and makes a dash across the tiled floor. That's when the moving roach finally catches the eye of the D-Class personnel. He yelps in surprise and pulls his feet up, his knees going flush with his chest. The roach looks oddly out of place in this clean and well-maintained bathroom, and the sight of this disgusting little vermin fills the D-Class with a sudden and deep sense of loathing. That's one massive cockroach, he mumbles to himself. Almost as if it heard his words, the roach starts to skitter toward him. The D-Class does not like that at all. Without hesitation, he immediately stomps on the roach, bringing his foot down with a definite thud and then grinding the unfortunate insect under his heel. The sound is loud enough to attract the attention of the agent behind the camera. Apparently, she must have returned to her post after sending a request for a technician. What was that? She asks, her voice crackling over the intercom. There was a really huge cockroach, just came out of the tub. Come on, hurry up and get the door open. I don't like it in here. There might be more of them. Okay, okay, says the agent. Just hold on for a second. Help will be here in just a couple minutes. Don't be so jumpy, it's just a bug after all, nothing to worry about. The D-Class personnel isn't so sure of that. After all, when you're dealing with unknown anomalies like those in the SCP archives, can you ever just not worry? He pulls his shoe off, stands up from the toilet, and walks over to the sink. Grumbling to himself, he turns the faucet and starts to wash the insect icor off the bottom of his shoe. He's too intent on his activity to notice that a second cockroach has already popped out of the bathtub drain. Like the first one, it hesitates for a moment, and then it scuttles across the tub, scales the walls, and makes a beeline for its deceased comrade. As this happens, a third roach emerges from the drain, and a fourth. By the time the D-Class turns around, a whole battalion of cockroaches has entered the bathroom. His eyes go wide as he takes in the scene. A good dozen roaches have clustered around the first smashed roach, all feeding on its carcass. It's a grisly scene, and the D-Class is immediately revolted. He knows nothing about roaches, nothing that might suggest to him that this is in any way unusual behavior for these insects, but he doesn't really care. It looks disgusting, and he's positive that it isn't natural. I don't like this, I don't like this, he yells, panic rising in his voice. Get me out of here! Hurry up and open the stupid door! The observing agent, safe in her office, doesn't share the D-Class personnel's terror. From her point of view, she's just watching a man freak out over a couple of perfectly ordinary bugs. Of course, the scene takes on a whole different feel when you're not the one being asked to expose yourself to strange and potentially dangerous SCPs. She can't help but chuckle at the scene. It's not funny, cries the D-Class, once again jumping on the toilet and pulling up his legs into a fetal position. Those things are huge! You better get me out of here now, or… 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 He struggles to think of some threat that might convince the agent to take him seriously, but he fails. The agent is too busy taking notes on the situation. The roaches look to be ordinary specimens of the American cockroach, each about five or six centimeters long. When the group of roaches has devoured their smashed comrade, that's when things start to get really strange. The small group turns as one toward the D-Class. Now that is weird, thinks the agent. The D-Class probably thinks the same, because he starts to scream incoherently. Both agent and D-Class are so focused on the roaches that they don't notice something even more sinister happening in the bathtub. A dark, tar-like substance has started to seep out of the drain, gradually filling the bathtub. The agent is too busy trying to soothe the D-Class, trying to convince him to stop screaming and start explaining the scene to her in rational detail so that she can add his observations to her notes. Meanwhile, the oily black tar continues to bubble from the drain, the surface level rising, until the tub is approximately one-fifth full of black goo. The D-Class's eyes suddenly alight on the tub. What the… What, what's this? He mutters. Suddenly, dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds, of roaches start to rise from the black goo. They boil over the sides of the tub in massive chitinous waves, spreading across the floor of the bathroom in a solid sheet of glimmering black carapaces. It happens so fast that the D-Class can only gibber in mindless terror. There are too many roaches. For the moment, the D-Class seems safe perched on the toilet. The roaches can't scale up the shiny porcelain, slipping back down at every attempt. He scrambles to his feet, standing on top of the toilet lid and praying that it will hold his full weight. Otherwise, he's going to tumble head first into that writhing, seething swarm of vermin. He stares at what looks like an ocean of living insects, the light reflecting off their chitinous shells with an evil oily gleam. It's like a scene out of a cheesy horror movie, but it's all too real. Through his panic, the D-Class vaguely recalls that when he was a kid, he once read a book about ancient life on Earth during the Permian era, when the Earth was a hot, humid jungle, when high temperatures and oxygen-rich air made the world perfect for giant insects. 
Cockroaches have lived on this earth for how many million years, he wonders. He knows it's a lot, and he can't help but think about that legacy now that he's confronted with a living carpet made entirely out of roaches. Aren't scientists always predicting that cockroaches will eventually outlive humanity? They're the only nasty little things tenacious enough to survive a nuclear holocaust or the punishments of climate change. He's less worried that cockroaches will outlive humanity right now, though, and more worried that they might outlive him personally. The roaches can't get up the toilet, but they have more success in scaling the walls. Soon the walls are covered in a mass of roaches, the air filling with a constant cacophony of chittering and scratching that sends chills up the spine of the panicking D-Class. The roaches start to march across the ceiling, and the D-Class gets the distinct impression that, if he doesn't do something fast, he's going to be completely covered. In desperation, he throws his shoe across the room with all his might, shouting curses as he does, but it doesn't do any good. His shoe hits the opposite wall and bounces off, dropping into the swarm and quickly sinking beneath the rolling tide of chittering insects. His futile attack only provokes the insect mob, and several dozen roaches take flight, launching themselves at the D-Class. He shouts and claws them away as roaches land on his face and shoulders. They scramble up his neck and tangle themselves in his hair. He keeps shouting and swatting them away, but there are more and more of them every second. More roaches are swarming out from the black oil simmering in the bathtub every second, and now they all seem intent on the D-Class. They crawl inside his mouth as he screams. He gags and coughs, trying to spit them out, but it seems that they're already crawling down his throat. In his panic, he slips and lurches forward, screaming and flailing his arms helplessly. He dives into the writhing mass of roaches. Within seconds, he is covered in a sheet of living insects. The observing agent is speechless, unable to comprehend the sheer insanity of what she is seeing, but watching the D-Class be consumed by cockroaches prompts her to vomit in disgust. The retching, gagging noises can be heard over the intercom, hardly professional behavior, but we're way past worrying about that by now. By now, the bathtub is almost completely filled with black goo. The roaches start to return to the bathtub, scaling the tub walls in vast waves and throwing themselves into the pool of dark tar. As they retreat, they reveal the decimated remains of the D-Class. The corpse is ragged and bloody, partially eaten, its stomach visibly bloated. It twitches slightly, and the observing agent momentarily wonders if it's somehow possible that the D-Class personnel survived his ordeal, even though even a brief glance at the state of the corpse should make it clear it would be impossible. There's just far too much damage. It's obvious, in fact, that the twitching is caused by roaches that have burrowed into the body, squirming beneath its skin. Suddenly, something else begins to rise from the bathtub. It's another corpse, one in a much more advanced state of decomposition, to the point that it's nearly skeletal, but there's still enough flesh clinging to its bones that you might be able to recognize it for the person it used to be. Under the black ooze, there's still a ghost of a face clinging to the skull, liquefying eyeballs still rolling around loosely in its dark sockets, tattered lips hanging off of stained teeth. Its eyes swivel toward the prone body of the D-Class with malevolent intention. Black tar drips from its arms and skull. It places one hand against the rim of the bathtub, the other against the blue wallpapered wall, and slowly hoists itself up and out of the pool of black tar, displacing another few dozen cockroaches with its movements. The corpse slowly stumbles to its feet, dribbling black ichor, and steps out of the bathtub. It staggers across the room with sticky, uncertain steps, leaving a trail of roaches and black goo. When it reaches the body of the D-Class, it grabs it by the leg and then drags it back across the bathroom floor toward the tub. The skeletal corpse pulls the body of the D-Class personnel into the tub, and both of them submerge into the black goo. The remaining cockroaches follow suit, jumping into the black oil and slowly sinking below the surface. At the same time, the level of the black substance begins to fall as it starts to swirl away down the drain. After several minutes, the black goo has completely drained away, leaving no trace that it ever existed. The roaches, the strange living cadaver, and the corpse of the D-Class have all completely vanished, so that by the time the door of the bathroom clicks open again, there's nothing to suggest that there's anything at all strange about this room. Too late, the agent bursts into the room, flinging open the now unlocked door with all her might. She scans the room in confusion, knowing that just moments ago, it was the scene of grisly carnage. There's no evidence of that now, but just the memory, the sight of the D-Class's bloated corpse, the sound of thousands of cockroaches marching and scuttling in unison, is enough to make the bile rise in her throat. She leans forward, hands on her knees, and vomits again. She's seen a lot as an SCP Foundation agent, but this SCP is definitely not one for the faint of heart, or the sick of stomach. 
What just happened here? Unfortunately, this is far from an unusual occurrence when you're dealing with SCP-6698. SCP-6698 is to all appearances a perfectly ordinary bathroom. Until it started to manifest anomalous behavior, it existed as a second-story bathroom in a private residence somewhere in Alabama in the United States. The first instance of anomalous behavior happened the day after a resident of the household, a 16-year-old male, reported killing an unusually large cockroach in the bathroom. The following night, when using the same bathroom, that same resident was overheard yelling in fright. His screams were followed by sounds described as a sink breaking and then a body falling against a crunchy and wet surface. Other members of the family attempted to respond to these sounds, but found that the door to the bathroom refused to open. Once the noises subsided, they found the door suddenly quite pliable, but when they checked inside, they could not find any evidence of the bathroom's teenage victim. The SCP Foundation quickly responded to the incident, amnesticizing the family and planting a suggestion that the missing teenager simply ran away from home into their subconscious. The family was moved from the residence, which was then purchased by a Foundation shell company to allow for further testing. When a human enters the room, the door to the bathroom immediately closes and locks. The door will remain locked until the event is completed. Attempts to physically damage the door when it is in its locked state have all met with failure. A recording camera was installed in the bathroom to allow agents to observe the event as it unfolds. Victims who unknowingly wander into SCP-6698 will find themselves trapped. Moments after the door locks, cockroaches will start to emerge from the drain of the bathtub. Once the swarm has reached sufficient mass, the roaches will attack and feed upon the victim. At the same time, a black oil will start to fill the tub, laying the stage for the emergence of the mysterious tar zombie, which then removes the corpse of the victim from the scene. The observing agent noted that the skeletal corpse she saw emerge from the tub bore a superficial resemblance to the missing 16-year-old male, raising questions about how SCP-6698 might have bonded with its original victim. Testing was suspended following the death of the D-Class personnel, so it is currently unclear if the same tar zombie appears during every instance, or if perhaps SCP-6698 pulls from a rotating roster of previous victims during its manifestations. At this moment, the relationship between the tar zombie, the black ooze, and the legions of carnivorous cockroaches is unclear, but large amounts of spectral energy have been detected in the room, leading to an assumption that the event must be supernatural in nature and to the involvement of the Department of Spectral Phenomena. Since SCP-6698 only attacks victims who enter the bathroom and does not appear to be capable of manifestation once the door is open, the SCP Foundation has attached a special apparatus to prevent the door from closing of its own accord, and assigned SCP-6698 a designation of safe. One thing that is for sure, though, is that of all the ways that deadly SCP anomalies might choose to do away with their victims, being eaten alive from the inside by a swarm of scuttling cockroaches probably ranks up there as one of the worst. So that's something to think about the next time that you're looking for a little privacy in the bathroom. These winters are getting worse every year, that's for sure. The old cattle rancher doesn't know if it's the climate changing, God's judgment arriving, or if he's just getting older and struggling to keep up. Probably a strong mix of all of it. Whatever the cause, it doesn't change the facts. It's deathly cold out there. His ailing, elderly Ma's health continues to deteriorate. He hasn't heard from his delivery driver Orhe in days, and on top of it all, his loyal dog Marybell is out there barking into the darkness of the barn. The rancher heads out to fetch her. He doesn't know what he'd do if she froze. He whistles, but she doesn't look back at him. She just carries on barking up that road into the snowy night. The rancher wades through the snow and peers in the direction she's looking. There's nothing there, girl. Get inside. But Marybell keeps barking. She's insisting. He looks again. Is that? The rancher takes off running up the road. All thoughts of cold immediately gone from his mind, he races towards the figure as fast as he can. His frozen fingers fumble at the zipper on his parka. Icy wind stabs the insides of his lungs. Marybell shoots off ahead of him. There, he pulls the zipper down and wrestles the thick coat off of his shoulders just as he reaches the tiny figure. He drops to his knees and throws the coat over the shoulders of the little girl standing alone in the snow. Quick as he can, he wraps it tightly around her pulling the hood up and over her head. He takes her tiny shoulders in his hands and gives her a shake. You okay? Hello? Can you hear me? The girl sways for a moment, then collapses. He catches her and in one deft motion scoops her into his arms and takes off back down the road in the direction of his farm. Where the hell had she come from? There are no buildings around here for miles. No one uses that road except Orhe. 
and in this weather, she couldn't have walked all the way over those mountains. She'd have frozen solid. He bites the finger of a glove and pulls it off. With his bare hand, he clasps one of hers. By the feel of her skin, she pretty much is frozen solid already. He needs to get her warmed up, now. He kicks open the front door and bundles inside with a flurry of snowflakes and an anxious dog at his heels. The fire's not quite dead yet, so he rushes over to the hearth and lays the little girl down next to it. He can barely see her at all wrapped up in his enormous coat. She doesn't seem to be moving. Ma, I'm home. I, I found someone. The rancher grabs two dry logs from the side and throws them onto the fire. He piles kindling high on top of them and blows steadily into the embers at the bottom. They glow and swell in size. No taking yet. He blows again for longer, and again. He feels his head starting to swim. A crackle, a lick of flame. It's taken. Panting, he turns back to the bundled up coat on the floor with the child inside. Still no movement. A sickening knot tightens his stomach. What if she's... No, don't let yourself think that. Not yet. He reaches down and gently undoes the zipper on the parka. His trembling fingers push back the hood. She's pale. Deathly pale. Her dark brown hair is wet and clings to her scalp. The tips are frozen. At a guess, she must only be nine years old. Eyes closed, lips a sickening blue. But that's not the color that scares him the most. On her neck, there's red. Delicately as he can, the rancher takes the coat off her shoulders and hangs it up by the fire. She's dressed only in a plaid shirt, way too big for her. It looks like an adult's shirt, similar to an old one he used to have years ago. But on her neck, her hands, her feet, is that same deep red, layers of blood frozen to her skin. He sits back, his mind blank. He's seen that much blood before. Sure he has. When you work with cattle, it's an unfortunate part of the job. He's seen cows bleed out during childbirth. The girl in front of him? She's the same color as those orphaned calves that lie crying on the floor. A groaning sound fills the room. The rancher looks across at the armchair where his ma sits. She doesn't look at him, doesn't look at the girl on the floor. She just stares into the fire, same way she always does. Ma groans again, trying to express something she doesn't understand, being in a world without living in it. Ma, it's okay. Sorry if I startled you. We have a, um... We have a guest with us. But she just keeps on groaning and staring into the fire. The rancher buries his head in his hands and lets out a deep breath. Only the sound of his breath is joined by another. A tiny breath rattling and rasping through a damaged child's throat, trying its best to keep its host alive. The rancher opens his eyes and stares at the child. She isn't conscious, not by a long shot, but she's breathing, a little at a time. The icicles in her hair have turned into rounded droplets of water that glow by the heat of the fire. He snaps back to his senses. He's not doing her much if she's just lying there soaking wet. He runs off upstairs and grabs some towels and a fresh flannel shirt to wear. After several minutes of drying her off, he's confident enough that he's got most of the water off. There's still a lot of blood caked to her skin, but as far as he can tell, there's no wound anywhere that it could have come from. Brow furrowed, he leaves her under a bundle of blankets and fills up the kettle with water. Hanging it carefully over the fire, he walks over to the cabinet and fishes out a tin of cocoa from the top shelf. Hasn't been used in years, but should still be fine. He would make it with milk, but she's probably dehydrated. Lifting the kettle's lid with the poker, the rancher pours the brown powder inside and waits for it to boil. The little girl's eyes are open now. She's staring into the flames. Her lips are looking a little more pink, her skin a little more blotchy. You're safe here. Just stay by the fire and warm up a bit. You like cocoa? The little girl drags her eyes away from the flames. Her expression is mostly blank. She looks too tired to be confused. I don't know. I think you will. Ma always gave me cocoa. Okay. And with that, the farmhouse falls silent. The little girl stares into the fire. The rancher watches her, finally feeling the wave of exhaustion crashing over him. His ma has fallen asleep in her armchair. Only Marybelle stays awake through the whole night, staying close to the little girl by the fire, occasionally licking her toes to try and warm them up. By the morning, the snow stopped, but the huge drifts remain. As the rancher walks across to the barn, he finds it hard to believe that just a few hours ago, the winds were whipping at his face as hard as they were. The world this morning is totally still. What the rancher finds even harder to believe is that there's a little girl in his house right now, fast asleep by the fire. He checked her forehead when he woke up this morning, and she miraculously hadn't caught a fever. She couldn't have been out in that weather for too long, but it only made the question more mysterious. 
Where did she come from? Mary Bell didn't get up this morning. From all of the excitement last night, she must have been too tired for today. Walking through the crisp morning air, he can't really blame her. He shoulders the barn door open. A column of steam curls out of the opening. All of that warmth, humidity, and cattle smell is strangely comforting this morning. But as the rancher goes around checking on all the cows inside, he very quickly discovers a problem. They're thin. Way too thin. Some of them look to be on the verge of starvation. He'd missed it last night as he drove them down in the dark, but in the warm glow of the barn's lights, it's unmistakable. These cows haven't been eating properly. He pours out several sacks of grain for them into the troughs, and they all gather around hungrily, filling both their stomachs as fast as they can. The rancher leans on the railing for a moment, confused. Even in this cold, there was still plenty of green grass for them up on the ridge. That's why he'd taken them up there. They should have had no trouble eating until the snow came in last night. He doesn't like this one bit. Last time Orhe had driven down and collected some of the meat, he'd had a few questions about the quantity being smaller than usual. Were the cows sick at all? Not that the rancher could tell, but now, looking at them, it's clear as day. Something's up. You hungry? The little girl nods. They sit across the table from one another, eating homemade bread and soup. Ma stays over by the fire. Mary Bell slowly wanders over to the kitchenette and flops down on the floor, exhausted. Where are you from? The girl shrugs her shoulders. You know how you got out here? Remember anything from last night? The little girl just eats her soup and shakes her head. She doesn't look particularly scared or worried, just a little confused. Where are your parents? Do you have parents? Again, the little girl shrugs. The rancher sits back and folds his arms. He's tried to call into town, but his phone line's gone out in the blizzard. Not much to be done until the snow clears. He's got a good relationship with the police around here. If he explains the situation, then it'll all be okay. What do you know? Can you remember anything from last night? It was dark. The girl slurps her soup. I was hungry. So hungry. Then I saw the light and I went towards that. My car? No. Well, yes, later on it was your car, but before it wasn't. What was the light then? Where were you? I don't know. It was just... the light. Now he's even more confused. But try as he might, the rancher can't figure any of it out. And try as she might, the little girl can't remember anything more precise than that. The pair of them hop into the car and drive back out up the road that afternoon. The snow is piled so high that the rancher is having to get out twice as often as he did the previous night to clear a track for them. He isn't actually sure what he's brought her out here looking for. Clues, maybe? He almost laughs at himself at the thought, but that's probably the best word for it. If he can figure out how she got here, then he can work on understanding who she is and how to get her home. There's the damage to the phone line. One of the masts has collapsed, sagging heavily on the lines. That's not something he can fix on his own. No, sir. Looks like he'll have to wait for the snow to melt before making any phone calls again. That could be in one week. That could be in three months. He glances at the child sitting in the passenger seat. She's just staring out of the window in amazement, wrapped up in as many layers as he could put on her. They may be stuck together for a while. A lurch. The pickup plunges dangerously to the left. The rancher slams on the brakes and it comes to a stop just in time. A large chunk of snow in front of them comes loose and slips off the side of the road. It tumbles down into a gully that he hadn't even spotted. With all this snow on the ground, he has no frame of reference. Everything is just white. Stay here. The rancher opens the door and climbs out. He wishes Mary Bell was with him, but she'd wanted to stay home again. Poor dog. She must really be going through it if she wasn't even up for a ride in the pickup. Carefully as he can, testing every step before making it, the rancher creeps over to the edge of the gully. It's bigger than he thought, much bigger. It continues down, more and more sharply for a few hundred feet, all the way down into a... Oh no. There's a semi down there, a big rig, warped and bent, lying on the rocks. Just a glance is enough to tell the rancher it's Orges, but he just keeps staring at it in disbelief. It can't be. It... But it is. Stay in the car. The rancher reaches past the little girl and into the back seat. Grabbing a pair of crampons and some rope, he straightens up and looks at the girl. She knows it's serious. He can see the concern on her face. Stay in the car, he repeats. By the time the rancher makes it down to the truck, his legs and back are killing him. All this work over the last 24 hours is going to start taking its toll sooner or later, but some things have to be done. He pauses by the semi. It's on its side. He'll have to climb up onto it and try to open the door. Some things have to be done. 
He hoists himself up and manages to clamber onto the metal door. It's badly crumpled, and the window is smashed in. He doesn't fancy his chances of being able to get it open. One look through the window shows him that he won't want to do that anyway. Blood coats every inch of the inside of Orhe's truck. The cabin that the rancher is so used to seeing and sitting in is almost unrecognizable. Smashed glass is sprinkled across every surface with a dark brownish red layer of gore frozen into everything else. There, in the midst of it all, still wearing a seatbelt, is Orhe's body. It dangles like a limp carcass at a butcher shop, like the cows he hangs in the slaughterhouse. And like those cows, a large chunk of Orhe is missing. His fat stomach is gone, not just cut open, but gone. The tops of his thighs, too, and much of his chest. So much of him is just missing. Open arteries and lifeless nerves dangle in place. That must have been a hell of a crash. The rancher reaches over and pulls Orhe's cap down over his eyes. Not much else to be done right now. No way he can clean this mess up by himself. But as the rancher climbs up the valley, his mind starts to connect some dots. Dots that leave a sick feeling in his stomach. He's seen that much blood somewhere else, or rather, on someone else, just last night. He slams the door to the pickup shut and starts to drive back down the track. Since the snow stopped, all of the drifts that he'd cleared earlier remain clear. It's only a few minutes' drive back down to the farm. He doesn't say a word the whole way, and neither does the little girl. She clearly senses something's up. The sick feeling in his stomach remains. He pulls up the handbrake, and the two of them sit in silence outside the farmhouse. There's a truck in that valley. Did you know that? Yes. Is that where you came from last night? I don't remember. Was he... The rancher stops. Jorge didn't have any kids. What were you doing in his truck? I don't know. Did he... Was he... The rancher can't bring himself to accuse his best friend of the words that almost left his mouth. Do you think you might not remember because something bad happened to you? I don't know. The rancher closes his eyes for a long moment. Silence fills the pickup. Come on, let's get inside. But inside wasn't the safe haven he'd been hoping for. Ma's been throwing up, not just once, but a few times. She's distressed, groaning aimlessly for someone to come and save her. Marybelle is pacing around the room, yelping and whining. The rancher immediately goes upstairs to get some rags to clean up with. Perfect timing, as usual. But he stops in his tracks when he comes back down. His ma has stopped moaning. The little girl is kneeling by the armchair, holding the old lady's hand. The room is calm. The little girl gently places the frail hand back on the armrest and comes over to take the rags from the rancher. Returning to the old lady, the girl goes about mopping her up as best she can. Marybelle slumps back down on the floor. And that is how the four of them exist for the next few days. Ma gets sicker steadily, but the little girl stays by her side all day long, caring for her in every way. The rancher's glad of that. It gives him the time he needs to help his cows outside. None of them are in a good shape. Whatever it is, they're still getting thinner. He feeds them all the grain they'd normally need, and then some, and they always finish it off. Yet none of them are getting any fatter. The rancher leans on the railing, trusty dog by his side. His energy is starting to really lag behind what he needs. The last couple of days, even though he hasn't done all that much, have totally taken it out of him. How do you think it is, Mary Bell? He looks down at his little friend. She's looking thinner too, actually. But she's been eating just fine. It hits him. Tapeworms. As soon as the word comes into his head, it makes total sense. His cows, his entire herd by the looks of things, have been riddled with tapeworms. Oh, hell. He hasn't got anywhere near the amount of medicine needed to give some to all of them. Even if he did, a lot of them are looking pretty far gone. The chance of reinfection would be high. He needs supplies. He needs Orhe. Marybell whines softly next to him. He knows what they have to do. Laying Marybell down carefully by the fire, the rancher administers the tapeworm medicine. For a few hours, they lie there together. He strokes her side, waiting for her to pass it. The little girl watches over his shoulder. His ma sits back in her chair, mumbling to herself. He hasn't talked to the little girl anymore about Orhe yet. He isn't sure what there is to say. Maybe he should ask if Orhe was sick. After all, the cows clearly have had these tapeworms since before the other night. Orhe may have picked up contaminated meat from him last time he came. Maybe... Marybell passes the worm on the rug. Ugh, the smell. The rancher uses the tongs next to the fire to pick the worm up. It's long and pale. And dead. He tosses it into the fire and puts the tongs in the flames for a bit to sterilize them. The worm sizzles and pops in the flames. 
The sound makes his stomach crawl. The rancher glances around and sees the little girl staring at the tapeworm. He looks past the girl to his ma sitting in the chair. Her turn next. But as that night and the following morning reveal, it's too late. His ma's groans turn into cries of pain. She openly sobs by the fire, clutching at her stomach. Every time the rancher tries to give her the medicine, she just vomits it back up. Each time she vomits, there's more and more blood mixed in. The little girl gets more and more upset. It's not fair on her to have to witness something this traumatic and disgusting. But there's nowhere else for her to go. She shouldn't even be here at all. The fact that she is means she has to help. That's all there is to it. By sunrise, his ma has passed away. There is nasty red bruising all across her abdomen, which tells him she must have bled out internally from this worm. He'd been too late to realize what was wrong. Too late with the cows, and too late with his ma. He covers his ma with a blanket, and tells the little girl not to go and wash her hands. He needs to check on the cattle. Sure enough, during the night, a handful of them died too. The calves. They were the ones to go first whenever something like this happened. Mother cows stood over their calves, licking their heads, willing them to wake up. The rancher drags each body out to the back and burns them. He can't risk any more contamination. As the carcasses burn, he allows himself to cry. But when the rancher comes back into the house, it's full of noise, a noise that takes his brain a long time to comprehend. Crying, but not his own, not the little girl either. No, it was a new sound. It was a baby, a newborn child screaming at the top of its lungs. The rancher can't believe what he's looking at. The little girl is sitting at the hearth with Marybelle at her feet. In her arms, drenched in blood, is a baby. The girl looks up at him and smiles sweetly. It's a boy. Then she turns around to his ma's body under the blanket. A sickening red patch soaks through the fabric, right over where her stomach would be. What the hell happened here? I've got a little brother. Securing and containing SCP-1003 has proven challenging. This is largely because the tapeworm that causes all of this damage is virtually indistinguishable from Echinococcus granulosus, the common variety of tapeworm that causes hydatid disease. The tapeworm, designated SCP-1003-1, follows the same life cycle as other regular worms. Its eggs come into contact with an animal through contaminated meat, saliva, or unclean surfaces and are ingested. Once inside the gut, they grow and latch onto the inside of the digestive tract, where they feed on the nutrients of the food traveling past them, steadily growing bigger and stronger. Once mature, they lay eggs, which pass out in the animal's excrement to continue the process. Infections spread quickly, particularly in unsanitary conditions amongst livestock, and can often be difficult to contain, as by the time the symptoms – nausea, weight loss, fever – start to manifest in the infected, the worms have likely already reproduced and have a new generation growing in the guts of other animals. As far as the Foundation is aware, SCP-1003 follows this normal pattern in all observed animals except humans. When a human ingests an egg from this tapeworm, a very different creature starts to grow in their gut. Human embryos, with the same genetic code as the tapeworm, begin to form. The rate of their growth is greatly accelerated, however. By just eight weeks, they are as mature as the typical three-week-old neonate or newborn child, although similar in size to an eight-week-old embryo at 13 to 16 centimeters. Many eggs usually enter this fertilization period, but almost all of them die before having a chance to develop much beyond the early stages. They stand the best chance of survival when buried in the hepatic tissue, where they can absorb plenty of nutrients from their host. The host at this point usually starts to experience mild symptoms, lethargy, the occasional stomach cramp, nothing particularly severe. Yet, the embryos that survive soon develop rows of temporary, razor-sharp teeth. At this point, passively absorbing nutrients is no longer enough for them. They bury their teeth into the soft tissue surrounding them and begin to eat. Once they enter this stage, their rate of growth increases exponentially the more flesh they consume. Eventually burrowing out into the world, the tapeworm child is born drenched in blood. The size and apparent age of the child that emerges from the corpse are determined by the size of the person they consume. For example, the child eating its way out of the rancher's maw appeared to be only a 10-month-old child, as there was very little of the frail old woman for it to eat. By contrast, the little girl who emerged from Orhe's gut had plenty of fat to feast on and so was able to grow to the size of a 9-year-old. Once the child emerges, the teeth that they'd used to eat their way out quickly become loose and are replaced by regular human teeth. The children themselves have no memory at all of where they've come from or what they are. 
They have the same motor and linguistic skills that a regular child would possess at their age. Nothing, aside from their DNA, marks them out as being any different from the children around them, blissfully ignorant, just like the children around them. It is theorized that many of these children end up in orphanages. With no birth certificates or identifiable parents, they fall through the gaps in the system, quickly lost to the world. The only way to really track them at all is to follow the infections they cause. You see, these tapeworm children have one final curse they must live with. Their bodily fluids, their saliva, and sweat contain the same tapeworm protoscolex that will develop into SCP-1003-1 as soon as it is ingested by another creature, making the cycle start all over again. If you want to track down a tapeworm child, and I highly advise that you don't, all you have to do is follow the trail of nasty stomach infections, internal bleeding, and freak pregnancies amongst the outcasts of society. It, unfortunately, will not take long. There are currently 10 instances of SCP-1003-2 in containment. The children live in Bioresearch Area 13, under strict supervision. Researchers are only permitted to enter their cells whilst wearing full-body biohazard suits, but first must have Level 4 security clearance and must have written permission, and can only enter with specific research goals agreed upon. All staff are regularly tested for the presence of any kind of tapeworms in their system. No other animals are permitted in this facility. It's a quiet day in a small American town. It's warm, with a slight breeze. A calm, simple Sunday, just like so many others. Very few people set their alarms, and most are still asleep at 8 a.m. It's the kind of town where everyone knows and trusts everyone else. After all, what are good neighbors for? While his wife still sleeps back in their modest home, a retired man in his mid-60s decides to start the day off right. With a rod in one hand and a tackle box in the other, he makes his way down the side of a grassy embankment towards his favorite fishing spot along the local river. He's even got a pair of neatly cut sandwiches in an old-fashioned metal lunch pail, the picture of small-town bliss. But something he sees stops him in his tracks. Something large, floating in the water. He freezes. He wants to write it off as driftwood or some trash that someone has thrown into the river, but in his heart of hearts, he knows better than that. What's floating in the water is a human corpse. Not long after, the local sheriff's department is on the scene, dredging the body out of the water. It's about as small and underfunded as you can expect for a group of police officers from a place where nothing ever seems to happen. There hadn't been a murder in this quaint little burg in years. When they turn over the body, it isn't hard to make a positive ID. The pallid, water-bloated face of a well-known local man stares up at them with blank, dead eyes. Some in attendance gasp at the sight of it. It had been years since the last murder in town, but when that last murder had occurred, the prime suspect had been this very same man. Ten years prior, he had been a successful local mechanic, but that all changed when his wife turned up dead in a field, her face caved in by some kind of heavy bludgeoning instrument. It was a brutal crime, the most horrific the town had ever seen. Reporters traveled in from all over the state to cover it. And that's when the web of secrets tied around this one tragic incident began to truly unravel. It was an open secret in town that the man and his wife weren't exactly on the fondest of terms. He was known for having affairs with women half his age. Rumor had it that his wife was tired of being betrayed and humiliated by her good-for-nothing philandering husband and was finally going to break it off. With the knowledge of his infidelity being so public, she'd take him for all he was worth in divorce court. And it wasn't long after these rumors began that she turned up dead. Soon, fingers were pointed, most of them, naturally, in the man's direction. He lawyered up and denied every charge, but in the court of public opinion, he'd already been convicted. That, however, was the only court he'd ever be convicted in. Despite the wealth of circumstantial evidence, there wasn't enough to convict him of his wife's killing. He was acquitted of all charges and went free, despite his reputation in town taking a severe dive. In the next few years, he'd marry one of his very young mistresses, and the news story would fade away back into the darkness of small-town rumors and hearsay. The murder of his wife would remain forever unsolved. With all the context in mind, the fishermen, a few locals, and the handful of police officers stare down at the dead face of the man, his soaked body sprawled out on the riverbank. A police deputy uses a gloved hand to tilt his head upward slightly, revealing the long, deep wound in his throat carved so deep it cuts to bone. His throat had been slashed, and whoever had done it had been extremely thorough. The identity of the victim had been confirmed, as had the method of murder. Only one question remained. Who murdered him? 
Hours later, across town, a man wakes up alone in bed after a long, refreshing sleep. His young wife of five years went downstairs a few hours before to do some chores and cook breakfast, leaving him to his rest. He rubs the sleep from his eyes and yawns. It's a sunny day outside. How wonderful. And he can smell breakfast cooking downstairs. He smiles, gets up, dresses, and makes his way down the stairs at a leisurely pace. He can hear his wife humming in the kitchen. As he passes the threshold, he calls her name, and she freezes up. Her body shakes slightly. Is that fear? He doesn't understand. He steps closer. Suddenly, she turns and screams at him, like he's an intruder wearing a ski mask and holding out a knife. He tells her that it's just him, that everything is fine. He begs her to explain what's going on. Instead, she asks what he's doing in her house and threatens to call the police. He has no idea what's going on. He takes another step forward, and she reacts severely. His young wife grabs the handle of her frying pan and swings it, hitting him as sausages and hot oil fly through the air. He shrieks in a mix of pain, shock, and pure terror before running out of the room. What is happening? Has his wife lost her mind? He needs to get help immediately. He rushes out of his house, but when he reaches the street outside, he finds no safety or comfort, only confused, judgmental stares from his supposed neighbors. They all turn to look at him with the exact same expression as his wife, a look that says, who are you? As he continues to run, calling for help and fighting back the pain of his oil-scalded skin, he just gets more of those same stares from everyone he encounters. They look at him like he's some kind of raving madman, not someone who'd just been the victim of a random and brutal domestic assault. And yet, back at his home, his wife is already calling the local police to tell them about the stranger who'd just broken into her house and tried to attack her. The sheriff's department deputy on the other end of the line can't believe what he's hearing. A man turns up dead in the local river, and before they can even give his wife the news, she's calling to report that a stranger had tried to attack her in her own home. Could it be any more obvious that this stranger was the one behind her husband's murder? Given that everyone knows everyone in a town like this, it stands to reason that her husband's killer and his wife's home invader must have come from out of town, perhaps a drifter or someone her husband had owed money to. Given the kind of person he was, it was no surprise that he'd burned some kind of bridge badly enough that someone out there would want him dead and act on that desire. Case closed. All that was left to do now was catch this violent madman and bring him to justice before he could hurt anyone else. What kind of justice would they give him exactly? Well, they could decide on the particulars later. As the man continues his frantic run across town, searching in vain for somebody, anybody to come to his aid, rumors begin to spread through town. After all, in a place where everyone knows everyone, people have a tendency to talk. It doesn't take long for half of the town to hear about the local man who'd been found dead in the river with his throat slashed open, that the same maniac that killed him had made an attempt on his young wife's life and she just barely managed to fight him off, that the murderer had come in from out of town and that now he was running through the streets, babbling like a psychopath. It doesn't take long for a consensus to form. It's clear that, if left to his own devices, this outsider will only hurt more people. Who will it be next? It could be any of them. The townsfolk feel afraid, upset, unsafe. But most of all, they feel paranoid. The shadow of the maniac seems to be lurking around every corner. If they want to keep themselves safe and avenge the death of the poor man in the river, they'll need to take justice into their own hands. Or this intruder could completely upend their town's quiet life. It's the only way. They unlock their gun safes and arm themselves with shotguns, handguns, and rifles. Those without guns grab bats, hammers, and knives. Some grab shovels and pitchforks from their tool sheds. This loose maniac may be dangerous, but they have numbers on their side. Together, they'll find him and give him what he deserves. The man is still running through the streets, in pain, wondering where everyone has gone. His life is falling apart around him, and he doesn't even know why. Is this all a nightmare? Is he going insane? Before long, he can hear footsteps. People are approaching in groups, yelling, chanting. He sees a crowd turn a nearby corner and stare. Guns, knives, literal pitchforks and torches, wide, bulging eyes and boring teeth. Someone points at him and barks, There he is! Get him! That's when he realizes that, for some reason, these maniacs have it in for him too. He turns tail and begins to run. He hasn't gone insane. Everyone else has. He can hear the thundering of their many footsteps chasing him. He ducks and screams as gunshots ring out, whizzing past him. Some even throw rocks. All these people. This isn't fear, this is pure, undiluted rage. They want to kill him in the street in broad daylight. He hears some of them screaming, Murderer! Murderer will get you! 
In his terrified mind, he wonders, is this what this is all about? His first wife? He'd been acquitted, it was so many years ago. Why would they all turn on him? Why now? It's... Relief swells and washes over him when he sees a police cruiser making its way towards him from the other end of the street. They'd save him from these bloodthirsty maniacs. The car comes to a stop, and a pair of familiar police officers step out. They seem oddly calm given the situation. The man approaches, trying to plead with him through a throat racked by pain, exhaustion, and terror. The mob is hot on his heels now. He needs help. He desperately needs help. But as he tries to form the words, he gets a hard lesson in the fact that these police officers are the wrong people to come to for that. The one closest to him slides the baton out of his belt and strikes the man across the face. His face feels a sudden explosion of pain as his cheekbone shatters. Before he can even register what's going on, the other officer strikes the back of his leg with his baton, and he crumbles to the ground. The two of them begin beating him relentlessly while he begs for mercy through broken teeth, and it's not long until the rest of the mob catches up and surrounds him. With a final strike to the face, everything goes black. When he opens his eyes, it's nighttime, and he can feel something constricting his wrists and neck. Heavy ropes cut into his skin. His hands are bound, and there's a noose around his neck, the other end tied to a branch of a tree above him. His feet teeter precariously on a stool below. The rope has no slack. He's surrounded by the townspeople, all armed and staring hatefully at him. The only light comes from their burning torches. The sheriff stands at the front of the crowd, his weeping wife standing next to him. With a stony face, he dictates that, for the crime of murder, he has been found guilty and is sentenced to hang by the neck until he is dead. His eyes widen one last time in pure panic as the sheriff holds up a photo of the dead man pulled from the river. What? No, there must be some kind of terrible mistake. I didn't kill that man. I am that man. I am. I swear. Please. But before he can even form the words, his own wife steps forward and kicks out the stool from under his feet. While this story of fear, paranoia, mob mentality, and unspeakable violence may seem as sadly natural and human as breathing air, the spark that ignited this tinderbox was decidedly inhuman. This is SCP-3852, also known as Small Town Justice. First, meet SCP-3852-1. No matter what your gut feeling may be, I assure you that you do not recognize him. He's an unidentified male corpse, and also an intrinsic factor in the SCP-3852 phenomenon. There are many SCP-3852-1 instances, and all of them are physically and biologically identical. And if ever you encounter one of them, unless the SCP Foundation can intervene in time, something terrible will happen. To put it simply, one of these unidentified corpses will manifest within the bounds of a small town or village typical with a population of over 2,000 people on the East Coast or in the Midwest of the United States. Upon someone seeing the SCP-3852-1 corpse, the SCP-3852 phenomenon will begin. Despite having no internal or external injuries in an objective sense, the victims of its anomalous effects will believe that it is a person from their town who has been recently murdered, despite the fact that this victim is very much alive in town. While initially it was believed that the selection of the victim, dubbed SCP-3852-2, was entirely random, as more and more SCP-3852 incidents popped up since the first was recorded in 1978, a pattern began to emerge. It was discovered that the victims were all people who were believed to have committed some serious or repeated crimes in the past, but who were acquitted or otherwise cleared of charges. But when the phenomenon begins, a frightening switch occurs. While the body will take on the identity of the victim for a number of the township citizens, the actual victim will become a depersonalized stranger, an outsider, someone to be looked upon with active suspicion that soon grows into paranoia and, eventually, uncontrollable rage and bloodlust. But the fury of the mob being directed at one person is one thing. A town being dragged into what seems like an outright civil war is quite another. The mob will arm themselves and go on the hunt for the accused. During the process, if anyone in town attempts to stop them, such as when individuals try to stand up on behalf of the accused, encouraging the mob to exercise caution and approach the situation rationally, as happens in many SCP-3852 events, they too will become perceived differently. It is estimated that between 11 and 27% of the affected community will not be swayed to join the vigilante group, and when they refute the accusations, they will be accused of trying to impede the course of justice. When the violence eventually breaks out though, as it always does, they will not be spared. When the victim that started it all is finally found, 
they will be violently executed, at which point the townsfolk will all begin behaving normally and life will resume once more as if nothing ever happened. In the aftermath, people will give inconsistent accounts of what occurred, but none will experience any long-term traumatic effects from taking part in or witnessing the violence. Since the phenomenon was first noted back in 1978, the SCP Foundation has recorded 16 different SCP-3852 incidents, some of which have been appended to the official files for expository purposes. One such event, labeled EV-3852-07F3T, is the very first that the Foundation encountered. During this 3852 event, which occurred in a small town in Indiana, 368 people were brought under the thrall of the anomaly's effects when the SCP-3852-1 body was encountered in the town square just after sunrise and was identified as belonging to a 28-year-old local unemployed man named Glenn. It didn't take long for the citizens to turn on the still-living Glenn, causing the poor young man to try and flee from the hundreds of people baying for his blood. He was eventually overtaken by the townsfolk while trying to cross a river and escape from the town. He was pulled from the river and beaten viciously. He was then dragged back into the town square and hanged for his perceived crime of murdering himself. The SCP Foundation managed to recover the anomalous SCP-3852-1 corpse before questioning the remaining townsfolk and administering amnestics. An even worse event occurred 18 years later in Ohio, recorded as EV-3852-15C1K. This time, 572 people were affected by SCP-3852 when the body of a controversial local man named Hector was discovered in a nearby schoolyard. Hector was a former factory worker until he was involved in a drunk driving incident that resulted in another driver dying and left Hector paralyzed from the waist down. When the body was found, suspicion of course immediately fell upon the real Hector for the crime. When roughly 23% of the community objected to these accusations, they also became targets of the violent mob intent on taking Hector's life out of their twisted sense of justice. When later interviewing one of the mob's ringleaders, a 52-year-old named Matthew Escott, the Foundation discovered that neither him nor any of the other mob members noticed the strange coincidence that Hector's killer was also a paraplegic man of about the same size and build as Hector. As predicted, nobody involved seemed to carry any guilt or even full awareness of what they'd carried out in pursuit of justice. Hector and those who were attempting to defend him were chased into an abandoned barn on the edge of town for a final standoff. The mob dragged out Hector and his defenders and brutally murdered them all. MTF Epsilon 6, also known as the Village Idiots, a group specializing in small-town anomalies, was called in to retrieve the SCP-3852-1 body and clean up the mess in the aftermath. Incidentally, a video of the carnage was somehow leaked onto the video-sharing website YouTube some years later, causing a containment fiasco for the Foundation. The investigation into the cameraman who filmed and presumably uploaded the video is ongoing and any information you may have into their identity should be reported to the nearest Foundation agent so that they can be properly terminated debriefed. SCP-3852 is an incredibly insidious anomaly, because even in the most desirable scenario possible, at least one person is doomed to die. In order for the town to be pacified and released from the anomalous effects of SCP-3852, the victim designated SCP-3852-2 must be neutralized. There simply appears to be no other way. When the village idiots are dispatched to a town in the thrall of SCP-3852, they are under strict instructions to execute the SCP-3852-2 individual as quickly as possible and distribute amnestics in order to avoid any additional or unnecessary bloodshed before collecting the SCP-3852-1 body and bringing it back for containment with the others at a secure Foundation site. Naturally, the SCP Foundation remains on the lookout for strange, hostile activity arising in small towns for fear that it could be another SCP-3852 incident unfolding. There is no way of predicting where the anomaly will strike next, given that anywhere with a population over 2,000 on the East Coast or in the Midwest is vulnerable to its influence. As such, it has been given the Keter class to reflect the challenges it poses to reliable containment. The fact that SCP-3852 seems to attack people with some prior history of accused crime does nothing to narrow down this roster either. After all, every small town, no matter how idyllic, holds dark secrets. SCP-3852 just provides a way to bring those secrets into the light. The mobile task agent weeps in terror as the nightmarish cartoon figures surround him in the middle of the bright pink, whimsical town pulled out of your childhood fever dreams. 
Deformed childhood beasts drink greedily from a fountain overflowing with blood. But the agent doesn't fear them. He fears Mr. Hister, the huge looming figure in the yellow cloak, brimming with tendrils, and that awful face beneath the hood, smiling its rotting smile. All around them, children stand trance-like for the ceremony, ready to receive their final judgment, as up above, a door made of mirror floats, surrounded by the suspended floating bodies of the people who weren't so lucky. Mr. Hister leans in. He's got a question to ask, and if the MTF agent can't answer it, something horrible beyond imagination is going to happen to him. That's just how it is when you're dealing with SCP-5853. SCP-5853 refers to a line of packaged taffy candies. Each package contains two candies, one blue with a raspberry flavor and one red with a cherry flavor. The blue candy appears to have no anomalous effects or adverse effects at all aside from getting stuck in one's teeth. However, the red candy is a different story. Anyone who consumes the red candy and recites a key phrase will be teleported to an extra-dimensional shape seemingly identical to the location of Tiki Taffy Town, a 90s-era television show that advertised the candy and has been designated SCP-5853-A. It was the UIU, a branch of the FBI specialized in investigating paranormal occurrences, who first identified the anomaly after they noticed a correlation between the airing of SCP-5853-A episodes and the disappearances of children. The show and its corresponding candy have been linked to approximately 3,500 child disappearances between the years of 1994 and 1999. As the UIU looked into unexplained disappearances during these years, a peculiar pattern began to emerge among several cases. The missing child was most recently seen in or entering a kitchen pantry. The only evidence left behind was a pile of open Tiki Taffy wrappers, specifically the blue raspberry variety. Shortly before their disappearance, the child was watching an episode of the show featuring the character Mr. Hister, and the missing child's parent could hear the show's theme music just before the child vanished. After a UIU operative's child joined the list of missing kids, the case was turned over to the SCP Foundation, along with all of the UIU's findings up to that point. Though episodes of Tiki Taffy Town can no longer be accessed by the public or by anyone outside of specific Foundation-approved testing, there are descriptions of the show's five main characters, or entities, included in the official file. They range from standard children's entertainment fair to imagery that is… deeply disturbing. First, there is the fatherly, patient Mr. Squibbles, a bipedal humanoid with the head of a plush octopus and a wardrobe consisting of khaki trousers and a red sweater vest. He is responsible for imparting each episode's lesson. Next, there is Mrs. Bobble, a stereotypical clown with blue hair, white makeup, a red nose, and oversized, multicolored clothing. She acts as the questioner of the episode's theme or lesson, raising these questions with Mr. Squibbles. The source of mischief in Tiki Taffy Town is Kizzy Wink, a small entity resembling a bipedal feline with humanoid hands and an oversized head. Though the entity is mischievous, it is also benign and largely childlike in its behavior. Kizzywink has a companion named Franzipans, a small, round, plushy avian with a hammer in place of its beak. Acting as an annoying sidekick to Kizzywink, the entity will fly around the screen and hit the other entities with its hammer beak as a form of slapstick comedy. And then there is the infamous Mr. Hister. This entity is not depicted as overtly hostile, but its appearance is the most troubling in the show. This humanoid entity stands approximately 2.3 meters tall and wears a long, golden yellow robe with a hood. The entity propels itself through the world with tentacles that emerge from beneath its cloak. Any attempts to produce an official description of the entity's face have proven difficult, due to the notable video distortion effect caused when the entity enters the frame. The closest current description of its face describes it as resembling a misshapen, tumorous human skull. A standard Mr. Hister episode of SCP-5853-A begins like most children's shows, with vivid colors, pleasant lighting, and cheerful music, as the main cast teaches standard lessons such as how to tie your shoes, why it's important to brush your teeth, and the value of honesty. When Mr. Hister enters the frame, however, everything changes. 
The video quality dulls, the colors become oversaturated to the point of becoming almost nausea-inducing, and the contrast decreases dramatically. The visuals aren't the only thing that change in Mr. Hister's presence. The subject matter also shifts in tone, as Mr. Hister torments the rest of the characters with nihilistic and distressing lessons such as, your parents will soon die, and so will you, and I feel nothing but the nothingness, or the particularly evocative, you may not believe in the slaughter, but the slaughter believes in you. When Mr. Hister leaves the scene, he always recites this phrase, I shall now be departing to the land of right, with the truth of red to be my might. This phrase is thought to be related to the various child disappearances attributed to the show. On January 4, 2000, lead researcher Frank Monroe conducted the first test involving SCP-5853-A. Accompanied by junior researchers Tracy Klaus and Morgan Eskew, and supervised by Ethics Committee consultant Jennifer Lamb, Monroe began the test with D-Class 643980 restrained to a detainment chair in the middle of an observation room placed in front of a television set. D-643980 was also hooked up to standard medical equipment to measure his vitals, while the junior researchers scanned infrared, ultraviolet, and other frequency wavelengths of the television program for any anomalous activity. With this setup in place, lead researcher Monroe signaled for the test to begin. The television was switched on and began to play Tiki Taffy Town Season 1 Episode 3, the first on-screen appearance of Mr. Hister. As the episode began, everything proceeded normally, aside from a small increase in Hume levels. As it progressed, however, the D-Class became increasingly agitated, his heart rate and perspiration increasing. He demanded to know why the show was chosen, explaining that he had childhood memories of the program. His younger brother used to watch the show all the time, until he disappeared. Upon hearing this, Ethics Committee consultant Jennifer Lamb became visibly distressed, but advised the research team to proceed with the test in spite of this unforeseen emotional component. After the episode finished, D-643980 was freed from his torso restraints and given a microphone, earpiece, receiver, and shoulder camera mount. He was then given a package of SCP-5853, at which point he remarked that he ate them as a child, but only ever ate the raspberry flavor, while his brother preferred the cherry. He was instructed to eat the cherry piece, then recite the phrase, Flesh is not the truth. At this point, the theme song of Tiki Taffy Town filled the room, and the D-Class vanished from sight, disappearing from the observation room altogether. Dr. Monroe was able to maintain communication with D-643980 via the microphone and receiver, and the research team monitored his video feed. The D-Class began in a dark place, with one single stream of light splitting the center field of view. After some resistance, he continued into the unknown, stumbling out of Mr. Squibble's treasure chest. Upon exiting the chest, the larger landscape could be seen, an exact replica of the Tiki Taffy Town set, with a blank white backdrop covering any areas not usually seen by the audience. As the members of the main cast, with the exception of Mr. Hister, entered the area, the D-Class hid in the chest. The four chattered excitedly about an upcoming town meeting before Mr. Squibbles opened the chest and discovered the D-Class hiding inside. He was instructed to engage with the entities until the Foundation could come up with an appropriate extraction plan. The D-Class became distressed and swore, prompting Mrs. Bobble to turn a glowing red until Mr. Squibbles calmed her down. Kizzy Wink asked the D-Class his name, and he answered that it was Davy. At this point, the entities instructed Davy to follow them to the town meeting where he would be their esteemed guest. Together, they left the house, entering an area made up of the miniature town from the show's opening sequence, only grown to full scale. In the background was the same vacant white backdrop, as well as seemingly infinite copies of the same town landscape. Davy and the group followed a long road toward a cobblestone town square. As the research team watched the video feed, they could see that other pathways in the background were occupied by their own versions of the main cast of characters, all walking toward the same central location. These groups were accompanied, much to the horror of the research team, by small children. Each of the houses along the path was printed with a number corresponding to an episode of Tiki Taffy Town that featured Mr. Hister. According to the research team's calculations, this amounted to 31 episodes of the show that were actively able to steal children. Dr. Monroe suggested sending in a mobile task force, but Jennifer Lamb refused to sign off on the request, concerned about the unknown nature of the location and the potential ramifications of sending MTF members inside. 
While the research team was debating about the next steps, Davy and his new friends reached the town square. There were over 100 entities and 200 children gathered together there. Some children were weeping, others stood silently, eyes ringed with dark circles from lack of sleep. Every single one of them looked utterly terrified. The entities began to chant together, I now arrive to the sea of sin, with the red of my flesh to offer him. A mirror-like rectangle appeared above the town square's fountain, spinning until it blurred into a black void. Then, Mr. Hister emerged from the darkness. Mr. Hister addressed the crowd, calling out, My children, it is time to tell Mr. Hister what lesson you learned today. He selected a young girl from the crowd and asked her to recite the lesson she learned. She answered, repeating a lesson from Mr. Squibbles concerning the importance of tying one's shoes. Mr. Hister replied, Your prize is to pass through the mirror and into the dreamlands. He lifted the girl into the air and tossed her into the mirror behind him. She screamed and disappeared. He proceeded to call up child after child, asking them to repeat the lesson that they learned. When they answered, they were tossed into the mirror. If the child couldn't remember their lesson, however, well, the less that is said about that, the better. Before long, the fountain was filled with deep red water, which the other Tiki Taffy Town entities greedily slurped up. Eventually, Mr. Hister turned to Dave, asking him what lesson he learned. Dave struggled to answer, guessing a phrase that Mr. Squibbles said, Don't make Mrs. Bobble upset, lest you fail his hideous test. This was the wrong answer. Mr. Hister lifted Dave into the sky, where he was suspended upside down alongside other humanoid figures, one of whom he recognized as his long-lost younger brother, Jeremy. At this point, Dave stopped responding to Dr. Monroe and his research team. The camera feed remained active for three days, suspended upside down next to Dave's body. On screen, a continuous stream of red liquid, presumed to be blood, could be seen flowing over the lens. The feed was cut short, and Dave was presumed lost. As harrowing as it was, this initial test provided the SCP Foundation with some vital information on the inner workings of SCP-5853-A. They were able to determine that, depending on the answer a stolen victim gives, they will be able to affect their own fate. If the victim answers Mr. Hister's question, what did you learn today, with the intended lesson imparted in the episode, they will be passed through the mirror. What awaits them beyond it, no one but Mr. Hister knows, but it is unlikely to be anything good. If the victim answers with a lesson they learned while inside of the extra-dimensional space, they will be left to hang upside down with Dave and the rest of those suspended in the air. If they don't remember or lie about forgetting their lesson, they will be consumed by the entities. But there is one way out. If the victim answers by repeating or summarizing Mr. Hister's darker lesson from the episode, the victim will be released from the extra-dimensional space and transported back to the place they vanished from. For example, UIU Agent Mathis's son, Thomas, reappeared in the kitchen pantry of his home on January 8, 2000, after he did just that. Following the D-Class exploration of Tiki Taffy Town, Dr. Monroe reached out to Jennifer Lamb, requesting that she reconsider her decision to decline MTF operations in the area. She refused to change her mind, telling him to scan media spaces, recall the candy, and call it a day. With the Ethics Committee refusing to approve MTF action, Dr. Monroe instead reached out to his friend, Terence Bazarian, who occupied an MTF Alpha position. He managed, via appealing to Terence's role as a parent, to convince him to agree to an off-books, three-man mission into the spatial anomaly of SCP-5853-A. The small, unofficial mobile task force began its operation on January 20, 2000. Frank Monroe served as commanding officer. Terence Bazarian acted as team lead, Alpha. Robert Falk as right flank, Charlie, and Mohammed Al-Abi as left flank, Delta. Each member of the team was instructed to consume a piece of cherry-flavored Tiki Taffy and recite the phrase, You may not believe in the slaughter, but the slaughter believes in you. Soon after, all three men were transported into the world of SCP-5853-A. They climbed out of the toy chest to find the cartoonish kitchen, the busily decorated living room, and the door to the outside area. The MTF team got to work investigating the area immediately, making note of the fact that all of the items in the house were fake, 
simply props for a children's show. The door to the set began to open, and the three MTF members hid out of sight. Monroe warned them to not, under any circumstances, engage with the entities in any way. The cast, with the exception of Mr. Hister, entered the room and began checking the area for signs of new children transported to the world. Alpha was discovered first and opened fire on Mr. Swivels, who stumbled backward, leaking brown fluid until it collapsed. The remaining entities began to scream as the area dimmed to black. Suddenly, everything was dark and silent. The MTF feed switched to night vision as Delta, Charlie, and Alpha began to explore the area. Monroe ordered them to get to the town center as fast as possible and tell Mr. Hister the key phrase so that they could be transported back to the SCP Foundation site. As he delivered the instructions, his audio feed began to degrade until the MTF officers could no longer hear him. Left alone in Tiki Taffy Town, they had to proceed on their own. As the officers resumed motion, Franzi Pans flew at Charlie's head at top speed, its hammer beak colliding with the man's head and sending him careening into a nearby wall. The impact was fatal, and Agent Charlie collapsed to the ground, dead. Agents Alpha and Delta continued firing on Francie Pans, and Alpha ordered Delta to head toward the door and make his way out. When he reached the door, however, Mr. Squibbles was waiting on the other side. It grabbed Agent Delta as an instance of Kizzywink used its claws to kill him. In a heroic dying act, Agent Delta pulled a pin from one of his incendiary grenades and charged at Mr. Squiggles, blowing them both up. Agent Alpha was the only one left standing, alone with Mrs. Bobble the Clown. She charged at Alpha as he fired a grenade round that subdued her. Taking his moment, Alpha escaped the building, navigating his way through the pitch black landscape. Alpha used his night vision view to navigate a narrow path toward a single light in the distance. He walked for approximately 182 minutes, at which point he remarked on the sensation of the path deepening, lengthening, and pulling him down. He began to approach the town square before everything faded to static. When Alpha's video feed returned, he was standing in front of a white wooden door. He reached out to open it and spotted a woman that appeared to be Jessie Bazarian, his wife, sitting in a rocking chair and humming a lullaby to the infant in her arms. He attempted to speak to her, but she addressed him in the manner of Mr. Hister, saying, See the mirror, through the mirror. The mirror is the only salvation. Salvation achieved by sacrifice to he who is divine among the dreamlands. Release yourself through the mirror. Ascend through the mirror. Transcend through the mirror. Alpha screamed, collapsing to the ground. When he regained consciousness, he was face to face with Mr. Hister himself. The entity smugly asked, Terence, what did you learn today? Rather than reciting the key phrase and attempting to return home, Alpha pulled the pin from his remaining grenade and let it fall to the ground. The video feed cut out, and the entire mobile task force that entered Tiki Taffy Town that day was presumed dead. Two days later, Dr. Frank Monroe sent out the following email, To whom it may concern and C. Miles, I regret to inform you that I am no longer able to fulfill my duties as researcher. I have come to the realization that Lamb was right, although I don't agree with her. I can't keep trying to save the world from the things we study. It's not about how far I can probe, it's for our own protection. I need to know when to call it quits. I could spend X number of dollars and X number of lives sacrificing to whatever to wherever I think, or wherever I think the mirror may bring us, who Mr. Hister might be, or the implications of a clown entity called Bobble. I could try to chase these down to their penultimate conclusion, sacrificing MTF, D-Class, and innocence alike. Lamb, she was right. God, I'm sorry, Terence. All SCP-5853 needs is to be hidden in the dark. I'm sorry, I'm just not made for this. Not anymore. I can no longer do this. Let me forget. Let me go back. Consider this my resignation. Respectfully, Dr. Frank Monroe. After a review by the O5 Council, Dr. Monroe's resignation request was denied. All SCP-5853 products have been publicly recalled. Any instances of SCP-5853 are to be kept in a standard containment unit in Secure Facility 64, Wing F. If any instances of SCP-5853 are discovered being sold, the sale must be intercepted immediately. Every episode of SCP-5853-A has been removed from the air, 
and television broadcasts and online video sites must be scanned regularly in order to prevent further spread of the materials. No Foundation personnel, including D-Class, that have or are considered having children may be assigned to SCP-5853. The SCP Foundation has attempted to uncover the identities of production staff and actors from the show, but so far, the investigation has turned up nothing but dead leads. A close analysis of the show's credits showed that, rather than a list of staff that worked on the episode, they consist of a constantly growing list of names. These names include those of children reported missing, as well as individuals yet to be identified. On January 23, 2000, the names Robert Falk, Mohammed Al-Abi, Terence Bazarian, and Frank Monroe were added. Frank Monroe was pronounced missing in action, and to this day, has never been found. Introducing Tamagotchi. Are your parents super lame and refusing to buy you a pet? Well, eat my shorts, mom and dad. With the all-new Tamagotchi, you can have the best pet you could ever ask for, living in the Digisphere in your pocket. With three simple buttons and a chain to hang your keyrings on, you can make your Tamagotchi your own. Care for it day and night, watch them sleep, play bodacious games, and make sure you keep an eye out for if they need to go to the toilet. P.U. Throw it in your backpack and take it to school. Just don't let your teacher catch you. Oh, snap! Tamagotchis are da bomb! Bet you really want to go and buy one now, don't you? The detective throws her bag onto the couch. She wanted nothing more than to have thrown it off as soon as she walked through the door, but if anything in it broke, she'd be screwed. They don't have the money for rent at the moment, can't be adding additional costs onto that. Her boyfriend barely glances up at her from the couch, still wearing the same blue t-shirt he'd worn to bed last night and with a packet of Doritos next to him. It's pretty obvious how he spent his day. The TV switches to another commercial. She taps him gently on the shoulder, offering him a warm smile. He jumps a little, seeming to come out of a little reverie. Affection fills his eyes as soon as he sets them on her. He hastily brushes Doritos dust off his hands and holds them up, tapping out words in sign language. Sorry, I zoned out. How was your day? The detective sinks into her usual spot on the couch and snuggles up next to him, nuzzling her head into his neck. After a quick hug, she untangles her hands and signs her reply. Long. He kisses her on her forehead. She goes on to tell him all about the case she's been working on. It's more of a hunch at this point than a case, really. There's been a big spree of shopliftings, burglaries, and muggings over the last couple of months. A significant uptick from this time last year, but everyone is at a loss to figure out why. She's having to spend a lot more on gas driving around to break-ins at the moment. Her boyfriend watches her hands recount the events with a tender look of concern on his face. Don't worry, she signs. I'll make sure they reimburse me for the gas. He nods and seems to relax a little. She hesitates before signing the next bit. Did you do any job applications today? Her boyfriend sighs and shakes his head. He looks ready to be told off, but instead, she gives him a big cuddle. Something in him seems to break, and after a moment, she can feel him shaking in her arms. Even though she can't hear him, the detective knows her boyfriend well enough to know that he is crying. She pulls away from him and makes firm, reassuring eye contact with him before signing. It's okay. We can do the next one together if that would be easier. And so the two of them do that. They cook dinner together, her boyfriend listening to the radio while she enjoys the feeling of the bass in her chest. Then, once everything is washed up and the apartment is dark and cozy, they sit down at their kitchen table and handwrite a cover letter. They would have typed it up on their Macintosh, but they'd sold that and their printer a few months ago to cover their utility bills. But handwriting is okay too. Her boyfriend had been working at Dell when they met, 1993, the height of the dot-com boom, when any kid with a math degree and a keyboard could shoot up the ladders in tech giants across the country. Two years later, that bubble burst, and he lost his job. Fiercely smart and incredibly kind, her boyfriend hadn't been able to find work for around 13 months now. Every day, the detective's heart broke a little more to see how low his confidence was dipping. He was an amazing person, by far the most exceptional guy she'd ever met and ever would meet and yet the constant rejection letters, failed interviews, and lack of options had steadily worn him down to a delicate and exhausted ghost of himself. But that only makes her want to love and support him even more. He scrawls a signature at the bottom of the cover letter, and they carefully fold it along with his resume and slide them both into an envelope. She cuddles him from behind and gives him a gross wet kiss on his cheek, enough to make him giggle. There, at least he's got one happy moment from today. He turns to her and grins, raising his hands to talk to her. 
I might buy a Tamagotchi. A what? The commercial on TV. It was playing when you got home. I really want one. Can I buy one? A little twinge pulls at her heart. She really ought to say no. Money is so tight at the moment with them both relying on her income. And it's hard to... Nah, what is she saying? He's clearly going through a lot right now, and maybe something fun would be good for him. Even if it does just look like some silly kid's toy from Japan. She raises her hands. Of course you can. And the pair of them go back over to the TV and flick it on. The next day is a bit of a blur. It's the detective's first day on yet another shoplifting, her first foray into fashion. Pairs of Air Jordans on display had been stolen, smashed glass everywhere. The thieves had left all the cash in the register. A couple other items were missing too, all very hip stuff. Tie-dye shirts, Jenko jeans, a lot of camouflage, that kind of thing. Stuff that's on TV and the radio all the time at the moment. By the time the detective gets out, she's only got 10 minutes to rush to Toys R Us before it closes. Thankfully, the Tamagotchi display is right by the front entrance. Almost totally sold out, but with one loan box left, she snatches it up and cheerfully takes it to the cash register. As she walks out of the store and looks down at the box in her hands, she can't help but wonder, why the hell would her boyfriend want to play with a little children's toy? As soon as the detective opens the door to her apartment, she is struck by a change. Instead of sitting on the couch watching TV, her boyfriend is in the kitchen, radio belting out at full volume. Her heart flutters. Could it be? Has he heard back from one of his jobs? He sticks a head out from around the kitchen door and grins at her, beckoning her inside. She grins back, quickly hiding the Toys R Us bag behind her back. It smells amazing in here. Onions and garlic, oregano, rich tomatoes, a hint of wine in the sauce. He's really gone all out making her favorite chili for dinner tonight. He waves her over to the pan and motions for her to take a deep smell. She does, enjoying all of the aromas filling the air. There's something smoky in there too, a new smell she doesn't recognize. She turns to her boyfriend quizzically. He grins and explains to her in sign language that it's charred peppers, held over the flames on the hob just long enough to blacken and then thrown into the food processor to... Hang on, she interrupts him. We don't have a food processor. Her boyfriend grins proudly and steps to one side to reveal a brand new shining food processor sitting proudly on their countertop. He explains to her that he bought it that day. It has 10 speed settings, multiple blades you can switch out, a miniature container for spice blends, and... She stops him again. How much did this cost? He looks sheepish. A wave of realization crosses his eyes, and he looks back at it guiltily. I just really wanted it, he signs. Thought it would make a nice romantic dinner for us. The detective softens. Of course, he was just trying to make the effort for her. It wasn't fair of her to tell him off for doing that. Opening the Toys R Us bag, she pulls out the Tamagotchi and holds it out to him. Compared to this expensive food processor, her gift looks pretty insignificant, but her boyfriend's face lights up straight away. He grabs it off her and rips the toy out of the packaging in a frenzy. His eyes shine and dance around as he hatches his first Tamagotchi. He looks like a child on Christmas Day. She can't help but join in laughing with him as they go to sit on the couch and watch some TV together. But the next day, when the detective gets home, she notices a hole in their wall. A literal hole. Their landline is missing. Her boyfriend's face pops out from around the corner, just as it did the previous day, with that same grin. Only this time, he's brandishing a brand new cell phone in his outstretched arm. It's tiny, about the size of a brick, with the name Nokia emblazoned across the top. That can't have been cheap. This time, she doesn't share in his excitement. Indeed, the next day, she can't even muster up a smile when he proudly demonstrates the alarm on his new G-Shock, laced up his new Jordans, and started excitedly flipping through his box set of R.L. Stein books. That is enough. She can't deal with this anymore. She's been struggling so hard to make ends meet. Meanwhile, he's throwing away hundreds of dollars on products he had never mentioned before. She snaps. It can be very frustrating being mute because you can't shout to let your anger out. All that energy instead goes into her sign language, her hands swinging and slapping into each other as her face contorts. What's wrong with him? Why is he being like this? She's doing everything she can to keep a roof over their heads while he's just throwing all of her money down the drain. How could he be so cruel? The more she rants, the more guilty her boyfriend's face becomes. Tears fill his eyes, his bottom lip starts to tremble, and before long, he's bawling in front of her. Can't keep going, not seeing him like this. Her hands fall limply to her sides. After a moment, he raises a sniffling face to her and signs something simple back. It's the TV. The commercials, they're just too persuasive. She snorts a laugh, and that's it. 
If he's not going to give her a serious answer, she's not going to have a serious conversation. She storms off up to bed, leaving him alone downstairs. He switches the TV off. That next day, she wakes up to breakfast in bed, but no sign of her boyfriend. She doesn't touch any of it, getting a coffee and croissant on her way into work instead from this up-and-coming coffee place called Starbucks. Today is a chance for her to take her mind off things. She's at a crime scene in a poor neighborhood. The previous night, the man who lived there had been sitting downstairs with his blinds open out to the street. He'd noticed a suspicious figure walking past who'd peered in through the glass. Before he knew what was happening, a brick crashed through his window and the burglar was in his home, running from room to room, ransacking the place and trying to make off with different items from the house. The homeowner had run to his gun safe and shot the burglar in the back four times. The crime scene investigation was mostly a formality, but as the detective arrived, one of the officers came over to her. He didn't know sign language, so the pair of them wrote down their conversation on her detective's notepad. Yes, she carries a notepad, some stereotypes are true. The officer has a hunch, and a good one. The burglar broke into the house knowing full well the homeowner was watching him, a highly risky thing to do. But what was most peculiar was the list of items that the burglar had been trying to steal. The officer shows her the list, and her jaw drops. G-Shock watch, food processor, Nike Air Jordans, R.L. Stein books, a Tamagotchi. An officer across the room remarks that these are all really high-demand items at the moment. His own wife and kids have been pleading for some of these for weeks. The crime scene photographer agrees. It all gets written on the notepad so that the detective can follow the conversation. What was this man's employment status? She asks. Unemployed. She looks around the room. There's not much in the way of furniture here. Just a couch pointing at a big TV. The detective drives home right away, to the surprise of her boyfriend. He gets up from the couch and comes to see her right away. He's dressed much better, a white shirt on. He's tidied the house. The TV is off. He goes to start apologizing as soon as she walks in, but she brushes it aside, signing urgently to him. I need you to tell me everything about what you've been watching on TV. Confused, he runs through his list of regular shows that he's been watching. Buffy, Quantum Leap, The Fresh Prince, Friends, of course. She shushes him. What about commercials? All the things you've bought recently, talk to me about those commercials. He looks stumped. They're just normal TV commercials, nothing special or exciting. They're all different, different actors, messages, companies. It clicks in the detective's head. That's it. What about the voiceover? I don't know. It's a man, I think. Yeah, it might be the same man. You know what? I think it is. It's the same voice each time. And he only does those commercials? Her boyfriend thinks hard for a second. He nods. It takes a long time for the police to mobilize, as usual. The detective takes her findings to the commissioner at her first opportunity, but he looks pretty nonplussed. This spate of burglaries and muggings, all because of some persuasive voiceover actor, really? Everyone wants a Tamagotchi, everyone wants a pair of Jordans. These are just passing fads, that's all there is to it. So, she does it herself. The detective visits all of the advertising agencies that ran the local versions of the commercials she has listed, and finds the details for the voice actor on her third try. He's in the same state, but another city. But by the time she gets an afternoon to drive out and pay him a visit, it's too late. The apartment she visits is empty. After banging on the door for several minutes, a neighbor sticks their head out of a window and yells something at her. The detective can't understand, however, so the woman comes downstairs and writes a grumpy note. He's dead, yacht accident or something. Only she can't spell yacht properly. The detective pushes open her apartment door dejectedly. All that effort, all that chasing, for nothing. It wasn't so much about trying to solve the burglaries. Those were just things being taken. It was about understanding what had happened to the love of her life, her kind, caring boyfriend, the man who'd brought her so much joy, who had always been so considerate and gentle with her, suddenly going on a spending spree and almost bankrupting her. It just hurt too much. And now, coming back to her apartment and having to face up to that tense relationship just felt... Arms wrap around her and hold her tight. Her boyfriend's hand brushes the back of her hair, and the smell of his cologne fills her nose. After a moment, her arms wrap around him, after another moment, they both start to cry together. He leads her into the kitchen, where he's cooked her favorite chili again, only without the smoky smell. She looks around the kitchen. The food processor is gone. He pulls away from her and explains that everything is gone. All of his bad purchases he'd made have been returned. He hands her the cash for them in full. He still wants those items. He wants them more than anything else, he explains. But more than any of those things, he wants her. The TV is gone, too. So as they sit down that evening together, 
they just enjoy doing nothing together for a bit, catching each other's eyes over dinner and smiling uncontrollably before getting out a sheet of paper and writing another job application. There's something about this application, the detective thinks. This one could just be the one. Ask anyone about the 90s, and they'll have more fads to tell you about than historical events. Furbies, Beanie Babies, Gel Pens, Napster, the list goes on. But for residents in a certain part of the USA, some of these trends seem to touch more… obsessive. And that is all down to the actions, or rather, the voice, of one man. SCP-661, the world's best salesman. We didn't get to meet SCP-661 today, so allow me to introduce him to you. The salesman is a middle-aged Caucasian male. He is somewhat overweight, but with no major health issues aside from what is typical for someone of his age and size. If you were to have a conversation with SCP-661, and I advise you not to, you would find him rude, abrasive, and tiresome. He has a short temper and makes regular demands. You would quickly find that he is very much used to having his own way, and for good reason. For you see, this salesman is persuasive. Very persuasive. Foundation testing has found that this SCP is capable of extreme manipulation, verbally persuading you to want what he tells you to want, virtually instantaneously. It sounds dramatic in those words, but the effect is far more subtle than you may realize, which is the reason why he was able to operate for a while before being discovered by the Foundation. Test subjects report the effects of his persuasion as feeling like a continuous, low-level compulsion, a desire bubbling away underneath the surface until they encounter an opportunity to act on it. At this point, it becomes an all-consuming obsession, not satiated until you have fulfilled the urge. The effect is strongest with physical objects, which is likely why this salesman enjoyed so much success providing voiceovers for local marketing campaigns. Any product that he was selling would fly off the shelves anywhere where the commercial featuring his voice were aired. Perhaps those crazes in the 90s weren't so innocent after all. Testing on the salesman has proved enlightening. D-Class personnel were ordered to physically assault him, but he was able to stop the attack almost immediately by simply explaining to them that they didn't want to hurt him. However, test subjects who were threatened with execution if they stopped attacking him were able to continue to beat the salesman up for several minutes before the researchers decided he'd had enough. Though notably, they made it abundantly clear the entire way through the assault that they didn't really want to hurt him. SCP-661 naturally poses some level of threat to the general public, as his abilities could easily be used for far more nefarious purposes than selling a few more troll dolls, and so guards have permission to terminate him in the event of his escape. That seems… unlikely. SCP-661 is held in a standard holding cell measuring 6 meters by 8 meters. Any researchers interacting with him must wear noise-canceling ear protection at all times, unless they are deemed to be totally deaf by SCP medical staff. Incidentally, it was the work of the detective you heard about today that drew the Foundation's attention to SCP-661. Unaffected by his commercial work, she was in the perfect position to connect the dots and uncover his existence. With operatives through law enforcement, the Foundation was quick to catch on to her theory and apprehend him before word traveled too far. That yacht accident story was enough to keep the public from ever discovering his existence. That said, you should still be careful out there. Who knows if another instance of this SCP exists somewhere? Have you ever seen a commercial too tempting to ignore? Watched a YouTube ad that you decided not to skip? No? Me neither. But still, be careful. The young man watches as the lily-white coffin is lowered into the ground. He's surprised at the dryness of his eyes, seeing as it's his own mother being buried. But now isn't the time for questions. When the dirt is piled on and the small service comes to an end, the young man is the last to leave. Other than the eulogy, he never says a single word to anyone. She'd been difficult towards the end. He'd cared for his mother until her disease had made it so that she wasn't really his mother anymore. And then for another two years after that, things had been said and done that he wished he could remove from his memories of her, but the past is forever set. As he looks up from his mother's gravestone, he notices something strange in the distance perhaps 30 feet away from him. A little girl, maybe about 10 years old, in a school uniform, standing behind another gravestone. She's wearing a worn-looking plastic pig mask and carrying a dirty rag doll. The young man stares into the dark eye holes of her mask for a moment, wondering if he's really seeing this or if she's a figment of his imagination brought on by stress and grief. Then he blinks and… she's gone. 
For a second, he feels a frightening sentence looping through the dark recesses of his mind. You're starting to lose it already. A few years ahead of schedule, you'd make your mother proud. The young man shakes his head and leaves for home. Of course, he might see things on a day like this. The mind does funny things when it's in a state of extreme emotional distress. It was perfectly natural that he'd see strange things on a day like this. But that little girl in the pig mask really did look real. Arriving home is a surreal experience. It's the first time in a long time that he's truly felt alone, like a child lost in a vast and unfamiliar space. Something about it just felt wrong. He makes himself a microwave meal and eats it silently in the kitchen. The place is so quiet, no panicked yells or cries of pain. He sighs and looks out the kitchen window as he washes the dishes and, in the distance, he sees another strange sight. A young boy, 12 years old or so, standing out in the cold, dark woods next to his house. He's wearing only swimming trunks. Swimming trunks and a worn-looking plastic mouse mask. A rag doll hangs limply from his thin, pale arm, just like the one the girl in the graveyard was holding. The young man's first instinct is to go out and help the child. After all, it's a cold night. He could catch his death out there. But with another blink, the child is gone. Just trees in the dark. He breathes a ragged sigh and takes an aspirin. Something must really be wrong with him if he keeps seeing strange children with animal faces out there. He trudges upstairs, hoping that maybe he'll get some sleep tonight and feel a little better in the morning. Shadows dart in the corners of his eyes, but he pays them no mind. He can't trust anything he sees today. He pauses for a moment in front of the room where his mother used to sleep. It looks cavernous without her tiny form nestled in the bed. He thinks about how she'd last been in that same room a little more than a week earlier. He sighs, turns off the light, and goes to bed. That night, the young man has strange dreams. He feels like a tiny fish at the deepest, darkest point of the ocean, watching huge black shapes loom and shift around him. He's afraid. He feels like he's being watched. The sudden spike of terror jolts him out of his sleep, and that's when he sees them. The children in the animal masks seven of them now. They stand around his bed, hand in hand, like they're playing some kind of game, but in dead silence. Each one has a rag doll sitting patiently at their feet. Logically, he should be more afraid upon seeing them. It's the strangest experience of his life. And yet, he feels an odd sense of empty calm settle over him, like a warm blanket. His eyes close, and sleep takes him again. When the young man wakes up the next morning, something doesn't feel right. He's already dismissed the strange children with the animal masks and the dolls as a figment of his imagination, a half-waking dream. But what he can't dismiss is the numbness in his fingers and toes. It's like he'd spent all night sleeping in the cold outside, despite his room being perfectly warm. Perhaps he's coming down with something. Other strange things start to happen over the next few days. He makes himself a sandwich, and as he bites into it, he notices he can't taste a thing. Come to think of it, he really can't smell that much either. Could this be a cold? The flu? Something worse? Also, he just can't shake the feeling that he isn't alone in the house. It's as if he can feel a presence there with him. And not just one presence, but multiple. Could it have something to do with those strange dreams and hallucinations, the children in the masks? He suppresses the thoughts, not wanting to consider their implication. He can scarcely dare to ponder what's worse, that there really are strange little children in masks creeping around his home, making him sick or that he's losing his mind, just like his mother. He puts it out of his mind, but every so often, when he happens to glance out of the window, he can't help but see little shapes moving in the distance. When he watches the TV or tries to listen to music to distract himself, he notices that he needs to turn up the volume more than he ever did before. His hearing is getting worse. Could this be some kind of sinus thing? It's the only rational explanation. But it can be hard to apply a rational explanation when what's happening is inherently irrational. Several days later, after getting out of bed in the morning and standing in front of the bathroom mirror, the young man notices something is different. It's his skin. It's a pale, almost creamy color now, like all the life and vitality has been leached out of it. But it's not just that. He looks closer at his face in the mirror. His eyes. Have they always looked like that? Were they always that shade of dark, murky brown? Maybe it's his addled mind, but he can swear something is different, like the ground is shifting underneath his feet. That's when he notices something in the corner of the mirror. A little boy with dark blue overalls and a grinning cat mask. He just stands there, watching. The young man turns, hoping to finally see one of these strange children up close. But of course, 
There's nothing there. Over the following days, it all gets worse. Two weeks since the funeral, and his senses of taste and smell haven't returned. His hearing gets worse by the day, until he's almost entirely deaf. The sightings of the children don't stop, but they're harder to make out. Over time, his vision starts to blur, and no matter how hard he rubs his eyes, they never clear. He stubs his toe, cracking the toenail open from tip to base, and he doesn't even notice. Little by little, feeling itself is starting to leave him. He doesn't even notice until the day he decides to chop some carrots for a soup he's making, hoping in vain that this one might be the meal he can finally taste. But his vision is getting so blurry now, he can barely… The knife cuts into his palm. It takes him a second to even register, because there's no pain and no blood. He stares at the clean wound in his palm with detached fascination, trying to work out the shapes in front of him to make sense of it all. What are those thin white strands sticking out of the cut? He grabs the edge of the skin, though it doesn't look much like skin now, more like pale ragged fabric, and he peels it back. No blood, no sinew, no flesh, just puffy white stuffing underneath. He's in bed and has been for a few days now. He can't taste, smell, hear, feel, or even see. All he can do is think in the dark. He's confused and afraid. He wants his mother, but she's long gone. On the outside, he's shrinking away, drawing into himself. He can't move or talk as he gets smaller and smaller. They walk in through the walls, the children in masks, ready to receive their new toy. The young man is nothing more. All that's left is another rag doll with a pair of brown button eyes laying on the bed. A little boy in a rabbit mask steps forward and picks it up. He stares at it for a moment before the children leave and the house is empty once more. This is the kind of unpleasant, anomalous experience you can expect from a close encounter with SCP-747, aptly nicknamed Children and Dolls. SCP-747 specifically refers to the phenomenon of these strange, anomalous children wearing animal masks. Studies have shown that, masks aside, all of these children are identical to children who have proven to have died around the time that their anomalous counterparts first manifested. This leads us to the working theory that the SCP-747 instances are spectral manifestations of the children they once were, twisted somehow by the unifying force of SCP-747. This is a theory supported by several pieces of unsettling information. Agents from the SCP Foundation disguised as grief counselors conducted interviews with the bereaved parents of each of the deceased children, and through these heart-wrenching interviews, they were able to discover that each of the children who died had possessed a doll that they loved very dearly. So much so, that the dolls were each buried with them, because on some level, the thought of separating them from this last comfort of the mortal world was too painful for the parents to bear. Given the preoccupation with dolls exhibited by SCP-747 instances, the Foundation found these facts to be highly illuminating. The physicality of SCP-747 instances, or rather, the lack thereof, also points towards the theory of them being powerful spectral manifestations. They are able to phase through solid surfaces of up to 10 centimeters in thickness and can sometimes have difficulty in holding solid objects due to their partially solid nature. They live mysterious and lonely lives on a plane of reality adjacent to our own, and they have never been seen to speak, though it's likely that they do have some form of communication with one another. Outside of individuals they're directly targeting, the SCP-747 children show little interest in other non-anomalous humans. They mainly seem to occupy themselves with their dolls and with each other. It is unknown to what extent the children are truly sentient, but they do appear to have some form of self-comprehension, manifesting in an awareness of the space they take up and their surroundings, which keeps them from bumping into things as they walk. But of course, their spectrality is hardly the most unsettling or eye-catching feature of SCP-747. No, the real danger of SCP-747 is the fact that they're able to turn human beings into dolls process which takes a matter of seconds to instill, but 21 torturous days to finally take effect. In order to begin this process, the children will select a human that intrigues them, perhaps one that would fit in nicely with their collection. The Foundation isn't currently aware whether there are any fixed criteria for victim selection or if it's just a matter of wrong place at the wrong time. When the time is right and their selection is secure, they'll lock hands and form a ring around the human in question for five to seven seconds. This is all it takes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven seconds. And you're already at the point of no return. 
After completing this brief ritual, the children will go their separate ways, and the process will begin to take hold. This is why it's so imperative for the SCP Foundation to keep a lid on SCP-747's activities. While there's no cure for the process once the ritual is done, it is possible to prevent the ritual from being completed in the first place by escaping the circle and leaving the SCP-747 children. However, they have cognitohazardous measures against this, with many victims reporting a sense of blankness or thoughtlessness while within the circle. They induce a placid state of mind to prevent resistance from the horrible fate they're bestowing. The transformation doesn't incur any immediate symptoms. However, after 15 minutes or so, the victim will begin to experience numbness in the extremities, much like the kind caused by cold weather or poor blood circulation. Symptoms will gradually worsen over the next 21 days, though if the victim enters a state of chronic stress or anxiety, this process could potentially shorten to as little as 10 days. The conversion can often be neatly divided into three distinct stages. Stage 1 – Loss of Minor Senses The most frightening aspect of this initial stage of transformation is the fact that many of its symptoms could easily be written off as that of more common minor ailments. The senses of smell, taste, and hearing will begin to dampen and then disappear entirely, in what may at first seem like a severe cold. The victim may express a sense of distress at their condition at this stage, but will remain largely mentally stable. Any deviations from that expectation into more extreme mental instability should be taken as a sign of an accelerated transformation rate. However, towards the end of stage 1, a more pronounced change will start to take hold. The victim will notice a slow shift of their eye color and skin tone to reflect the colors of the doll, though this is only the beginning. Stage 2 – Loss of Major Senses Over the next 13 days, the victims will begin to lose their senses of sight and touch, resulting in extreme mental instability and stress. The victims may attempt to perform gruesome experiments on themselves, trying to rediscover feelings in their body, only to become more unstable upon realizing that these senses are gone for good. At this stage, the frightening anomalous physical changes will become even more pronounced. The skin of the victim will take on a rough, ragged quality as it transforms from normal skin into a variety of fabrics. The internal organs are also slowly transformed into a patchwork of synthetic stuffings, and even the victim's eyes will start to harden into buttons. However, the victim will remain alive throughout this entire grim process, even as their autonomy over their own body rapidly fades away. Stage 3 – Full Transformation Within 24 hours of entering Stage 3, the victim is fully and irreparably turned into a doll. The SCP-747 children will treat this doll just like they treat any others, and if ever a doll created by the influence of SCP-747 is destroyed, they will show greater interest in humans once again until a new target for conversion is selected. The SCP Foundation currently has seven SCP-747 specimens in containment. SCP-747-01 is an approximately seven-year-old male wearing a set of blue pajamas and a zebra mask. SCP-747-02 is an approximately 12-year-old male wearing swimming trunks and a mouse mask. SCP-74703 is an approximately 10-year-old female wearing a uniform typical of an expensive private school and a pig mask. SCP-74704 is an approximately 14-year-old male wearing a winter coat and a rabbit mask. SCP-74705 is an approximately 12-year-old female wearing a striped sari and a giraffe mask. SCP-74706 is an approximately 5-year-old girl with a bright pink dress typical of a beauty pageant contestant and a goat mask. And finally, SCP-74707 is an approximately 9-year-old male wearing blue overalls and a cat mask. Interestingly, he was also found with a physical note, containing a short story about a mother searching for her child in the afterlife. Interestingly, the mother of this particular entity, before becoming an SCP-747 instance, is believed to have died in childbirth. All of the SCP-747 instances that the Foundation has in containment are kept in a single containment chamber, 30 meters by 10 meters in size, with concrete walls at least 15 centimeters thick to prevent the children from phasing through them. It is mandatory that any unusual behaviors by the children are reported to a superior immediately. If the children seem to take an interest in any members of the staff that research, guard, or attend to them, that member of personnel must be transferred to a different project immediately. The children are allowed a total of 25 dolls to keep them placated, excluding ones created by their anomalous influence, and the SCP Foundation only permits their dolls to be temporarily removed from the containment chamber for examination and repair. Any staff members who begin to show the previously described symptoms of anomalous SCP-747 influence are to be quarantined and contained separately. 
Task Force 747-B8 remains on call in the event of a containment breach to handle tracking, capture, and containment. Due to the incredibly volatile and dangerous nature of interfacing with SCP-747, Level 3 staff and above are only able to come into contact with them if the situation absolutely demands it. SCP-747 has been given the containment object class Euclid due to their phasing abilities and unpredictable nature. After all, who could ever really know what's going on behind those masks? But there's one more detail about SCP-747 that is perhaps the most frightening of all. There is evidence that suggests that the victims who have been turned into SCP-747 dolls may not actually be dead. In fact, they may still remain conscious, cut off from all their senses, slowly descending further into madness. A child is sleeping happily in their bed, dreaming of Christmas morning. What they don't hear as they sleep is the sound of SCP-4666 slipping into their room. SCP-4666 watches the child for just a moment before reaching into a giant bag. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-4666, also known as the Yule Man. SCP-4666 is thought to be a single humanoid entity, but one that has been alive for an incredibly long time. Those who have come into contact with SCP-4666 and live to tell the tale describe him as being very tall, between 2 and 2.3 meters. He also appears to be very old and very thin. He always appears without clothing, even when the weather is below freezing and would be much too cold for any normal human to survive. Though the true extent of his anomalous properties are still unknown, SCP-4666 seems to be able to travel instantaneously to any location on Earth above the 40th line of North Latitude and may actually be able to travel anywhere on the planet. Encounters with SCP-4666 have only been reported during a very specific time of year, a period of 12 nights running from the night of December 21st to the early morning hours of January 2nd. This period is known as SCP-4666's active phase, and the encounters with the anomalous humanoid creature have been termed Weissnacht events. During these events, SCP-4666 appears at family dwellings, all of which, so far, have a few things in common. 1. They are all isolated in rural areas. 2. They are in locations with snow that covers the area for the duration of the event. And 3. They are all home to a family with at least one child under the age of 8. In places that match all of those characteristics, Weissnacht events sometimes occur and always follow the same basic progression. During the first seven nights, the children will report seeing a strange figure within the vicinity of the home. The entity will seem to be watching the home from a distance, such as from across a field or from the edge of a nearby forest. Some children have even reported waking up at night to find SCP-4666 watching them sleep through a window. On nights 8 through 11, other family members will report hearing the entity, such as footsteps on the roof or in the attic. A bad-smelling odor will also start to be noticed in the house, but no source of the smell is ever found. These strange occurrences will often lead the family to think their house may be haunted, or that they're being terrorized by a madman. Finally, on the twelfth night, one of two scenarios can occur. In the first, which happens roughly 15% of the time, Families will often report that they heard footsteps during the night inside of their house, but there is never any sign of forced entry like broken windows or doors. In the morning, the children will find crudely made toys at the foot of their beds. For the lucky ones, this is the end of the Weissnacht event for them. The roughly 85% who experience the other scenario are considerably less lucky. In the vast majority of cases, the twelfth night is a horrible experience. SCP-4666 still enters the home on the final night, but rather than leave presents for the children, it incapacitates the family and moves them all into a single room where it proceeds to kill them one by one in view of the rest of the family. The exact method of killing varies from event to event, but there's almost always an element of torture that occurs before they are finally killed. 
and this torture may serve a ritualistic purpose. The entire family is killed except for one of the children who is under the age of eight. This child is instead abducted and placed into a giant bag SCP-4666 carries with it. SCP-4666's existence was first noted in 1974 by the Foundation's then new Anomalous Signature Recognition Program, which alerted the Foundation to several suspiciously similar home invasions and murders that occurred throughout the Northern Hemisphere on the night of January 1st. Further research uncovered evidence for what was most likely other Weissnacht events every single year, dating back all the way to the late 18th century, with there being, on average, a little more than three events per year. And there's even been evidence of references to what may be SCP-4666, dating all the way back to the 1st and 2nd century AD. Identical fingerprints have been found at all of the houses which match the conditions for Weissnacht events, and have been matched to a recovered partial print from all the way back in 1873. These fingerprints have characteristics that don't match any known human fingerprints, and the human-like white hairs that have also been recovered do not appear to contain human DNA, or any DNA at all for that matter. In the rare Weissnacht events where SCP-4666 does not murder the family and gifts are left behind, the gifts are anything but normal. The gifts, known as SCP-4666-As, appear to be made from the bodies of children that SCP-4666 abducted from other homes. In one case, from 2018, at the home of a family in Alaska, a life-size doll made from the body of a female child was left behind. The doll was wearing a dirty dress made from sewn-together rags that was in some places sewn directly to the skin. Her mouth had been sewn shut and painted red with human blood. Another child's fingernails had been glued over her own, and three fingers were missing completely. The scalp had also been replaced with another child's scalp and hair like a crude wig. Worst of all, both eyes had been removed and replaced with two stones which were painted to look like eyes. But most frightening of all was that the child who had been turned into a doll was somehow still alive. Authorities took the girl to a hospital where she was able to give a brief interview. She explained that the man who abducted her had killed her parents before putting her into a giant bag where there were other children too. SCP-4666 took the children somewhere deep below the earth in a cave system full of ice and bones. There, they were forced to make crude toys until they couldn't go on any longer, at which point they became toys. The girl, now known to be Ekaterina Morozova, had been abducted two years previously in a known Weissnacht event. She survived for only 18 hours after being discovered. An autopsy revealed many terrible injuries and the cause of death was found to be from severe, sustained malnourishment. SCP-4666 has been classified as Keter and is currently not contained. The Foundation monitors web traffic and law enforcement channels for any evidence of SCP-4666 activity, and especially any potential Weissnacht events, such as cases of stalking reported during the 12-night active phase or other strange phenomena at houses with young children. Should a Weissnacht event be suspected to be in progress, the nearest containment task force is dispatched to attempt to contain SCP-4666 using the standard PDP-8 humanoid first contact protocols. So far, no such containment attempt has been successful. It's the last day of sixth grade, and there are only seconds left before the final bell rings and school is officially out for summer. An excitable 11-year-old girl sits at her desk, bouncing her leg in anticipation and watching the clock. Soon, she'll have three glorious months of freedom. But more importantly, she can take her mom up on a life-changing promise. They made a deal when they moved to this new town. If she could get through sixth grade with straight A's and good feedback from her teachers, she could finally get a pet of her own. There were some stipulations, of course. The pet can't be too big, can't make a lot of noise, and needs to be something she can take care of by herself. It was hard work, but she buckled down, studied hard, and even found a math tutor. The time is now in five, four, three, two, one. The last bell of the year rings and the class erupts into cheers. Summer's here. 
She shoves her books into her bag and runs out the door so quickly she barely catches her teacher's parting words of, Have a great summer vacation, everyone! The halls are swamped with kids all rushing toward the buses, their parents' cars, or their final walk home of the school year. She's right there with them, the promise of the day putting an extra spring in her step. Many of the faces in the hall are still unfamiliar. After a year of being the new kid in town, she hasn't made many friends, but none of that matters now. She's going to get a special friend today, something all her own that she can nurture, play with, and won't ever have to worry about impressing. It's only a short walk to the pet store, and then an even shorter walk to her house. As she makes her way down the sidewalk, the sun beaming down on her smiling face, the girl lets her mind wander. What kind of pet should she get? A dog needs to be walked, that might be too much work. A fish? Maybe, but you can't play with a fish. You can't pet a fish, or at least it won't be happy if you try. She remembers a pet tarantula her eccentric aunt once had and shudders. No spiders, definitely not. She wants something friendly, something small enough that her mom won't complain, but something she can cuddle and really bond with. Whatever it ends up being, she's going to take great care of it. The walk feels much longer than it is, the anticipation stretching the minutes until they feel like hours. She spots the sign in the shape of a dog playing with a ball, and her heart skips a beat. She's reached the pet store. Inside, there are an overwhelming number of options. She walks through the reptile section, pressing her face to the class of tanks housing iguanas, slithery snakes, tiny darting lizards with brightly colored tails. Nearby, there are fat green tree frogs and bumpy toads with huge, watery eyes. She briefly pauses at the fish, enticed by their vivid colors and the staggering variety of shapes and sizes. But a fish is such a boring pet, she thinks. What can you even do with a fish? She moves on, looking at a litter of fluffy, tabby kittens. They romp and roll around on top of each other, flicking their tails and stretching their soft paws. They're adorable, and her heart melts. But then she thinks about having to scoop a litter box and decides to move on. There are roly-poly hamsters and sleek-looking rats, tiny white mice with pink eyes and gerbils running on wheels. Suddenly, a sign catches her eye. Exotic pets, it reads. Huh? What could be over there? She tiptoes into the section, almost feeling like she's stumbled into somewhere she shouldn't be. There are ferrets wiggling around and playing with a ball, fluffy chinchillas that look impossibly plush and soft to the touch, little sugar gliders peeking out of cloth pouches with wide eyes. There's even a skunk blinking at her curiosity. But nothing feels quite right. None of these pets seem like the one she has to bring home. Then, out of the corner of her eye, she spots something curious. A row of small cardboard packages covered with inviting cartoonish text, advertising something called a custom pet. She picks up one of the packages and reads the description. It sounds impossible, too good to be true. Just buy these packaged eggs, place them anywhere in your house, and a perfectly matched pet will hatch and fit right in. It will become exactly the kind of pet that you need. She looks for any sort of fine print, something that might indicate this is a toy or some kind of joke, but it looks real. Could it be? Shyly, the girl takes one of the packages up to the cash register. The employee goes to scan it, but there's no barcode. Did you bring this in with you? The cashier asks. She shakes her head. Okay, well, we don't sell these, so... I guess you can just take it? The girl's eyes go wide. Really? She can just have it for free? The cashier is already waving her off, beckoning the next customer to come check out. Not wanting to question her good luck, she takes off without a second thought. The run home from the pet store is a total blur of excitement. All she wants to do is get inside, make a peanut butter sandwich, and figure out where to put her new pet's egg before her mom gets home from work. Not that she's doing anything wrong, it's just easier if she takes care of things before her mom can ask too many questions. She's doing them both a favor, really, taking care of all the logistics so her mom doesn't have to worry about it. She pulls her house key from her pocket and unlocks the door with shaky hands. It's almost time. Forget the sandwich. The sandwich can wait. She needs to get upstairs to her room right now and start her life with her new pet, whatever it ends up being. She throws her backpack on her bed and sits down on the floor, tearing open the cardboard packaging. Inside, there are six tiny eggs sealed in plastic. She just wants one pet, so she'll start with one egg for now. Of course, if the pet ends up being lonely, maybe it'll want a friend? She shakes off the thought. She can figure all of those details out later. She's just about to puncture the plastic so the egg can breathe when she stops. Where should she put it? 
She was so excited to leave the store she forgot to pick up a tank or terrarium or somewhere a traditional pet would live. The packaging says these pets can live anywhere, but do they really mean anywhere? If she does something wrong and her new pet is hurt or doesn't hatch at all, it'll just break her heart. Then she spots a potential solution. An old dollhouse, frilly and pastel pink and surprisingly spacious inside, sits next to her bed. She hasn't played with dolls in a while, insisting she was too old for them when she started sixth grade. But now she's thrilled that she didn't get rid of her dollhouse just yet. Even if the dolls don't live there anymore, maybe now it can be a home for something new, for whatever hatches out of this strange little egg. Carefully, she breaks the plastic seal on the egg and places it inside the dollhouse. All of the doll furniture and little plastic choking hazards are gone, leaving only a pretty pink Victorian-style enclosure where the egg can safely hatch. Now, all she has to do is wait. Later that night, the girl wakes from a deep sleep to the sound of something moving inside the dollhouse, the skitter of tiny legs, the rustling of something inside the formerly vacant dollhouse. She sits up and is about to go peek inside when a chill of fear runs down her spine. What if it's something horrible? She doesn't know what kind of eggs those were. She'd never seen anything like them before. What if it's a spider or a worm or some other awful monstrous thing she can't even imagine? And she brought it into her home to where she and her mom sleep without even questioning it. She sits for a moment, the only sound the rustling of the thing in the dollhouse and her own short, panicked breaths. Then there's another sound, huh? light and sweet, like a little bird chirping. It's coming from the dollhouse. Curiosity finally gets the better of her and she opens the dollhouse, lifting the roof off. Inside, she spots it, her new pet. Feathery soft fur, pastel pink and white, covers the little animal, which is currently exploring its new home delightedly. It flicks around a poofy little tail that looks a bit like a lavender feather duster and stops to blink up at her with two large, friendly purple eyes. Slowly, she reaches a hand down to pet the animal, and it nuzzles into her palm, body vibrating with something like a kitten's purr. Any tension she felt before melts out of her body as she realizes the packaging was not lying. She put the pet in an environment that was comforting, sweet, happy, a piece of childlike joy, and it had become the living embodiment of those things. For a brief moment, she wonders how she'll explain this new addition to the household, what she'll need to feed it, and what her mom will say. But then her new best friend chirps happily again, and all she can think is, this is going to be an amazing summer. Things worked out very well for the girl. Meanwhile, other families across town were screaming in horror as a tiny fire-breathing creature set their drapes ablaze, and another slowly dropped down from the ceiling on a silvery thread, blending into the shadows. This girl was not the only child to bring home one of these miraculous pets and hatch it in her home, and other children were much less careful about where they put the eggs. Of course, the children weren't to blame here. The blame lay with whoever was behind the design and widespread release of these odd little animals also known as SCP-1550. SCP-1550 is a species of artificially synthesized creatures of unknown classification who are highly adaptable to any given environment. Their larvae will develop, grow, and change to fit whatever setting their eggs are placed in. Though adult specimens vary greatly in appearance, they all have markings on their underbelly that read, a Dr. Wondertainment trademark. Because of their highly adaptable nature, it is uncertain exactly what the original form of these creatures might look like. SCP-1550 eggs are one centimeter long, beige in color, and stored in airtight plastic packaging that prevents them from hatching until they are exposed to the outside air. The SCP Foundation first discovered SCP-1550 after a collection of bizarre cardboard packages were found in the exotic pet section of a pet store. None of the workers had ever seen these packages before and had never even heard of SCP-1550 prior to being asked about it. The packages were brought into containment immediately and were found to each contain six SCP-1550 eggs in airtight containers. The original packaging also contained an instruction leaflet, which I've managed to get my hands on a copy of. It reads, Hey kids, your parents aren't letting you get a dog or cat? Don't fret, buy a Dr. Wondertainment custom pet. A Dr. Wondertainment's custom pet is far superior to an ordinary and boring cat or dog due to their original Adapto Eggs packaging, a Dr. Wondertainment invention. Just leave your custom pet Adapto Eggs around the house and when they hatch they'll fit right in. Perfect for apartments. To get your very own custom pets is easy, kids. Just put an egg in your house and break the plastic seal to give your new pet some air so it can hatch. 
Your new pet will be perfect for where you live, wherever you live. If your new custom pet seems lonely, just add another Adapto egg and get him a new friend. Dr. Wondertainment is not responsible for injuries or death caused by this or any other product. Wondertainment custom pets are shipped out prefixed. Who exactly is this Dr. Wondertainment? A person? A corporation? A highly intelligent octopus with a penchant for toy design? The identity of the force behind the trademark is undetermined, but whatever Dr. Wondertainment is, one thing is certain. The toys they create are highly unusual. Dozens of Wondertainment's creations have been contained by the SCP Foundation, including SCP-2855, SCP-2396, and SCP-111. They range from useful to whimsical to downright destructive, and the motives behind each invention are currently unknown. SCP-1550 is just one in a long line of anomalous toys from the shadowy toy maker. And so, like they have with so many other Wondertainment products, the research staff at the Foundation decided to perform some exploratory tests on these supposed custom pets. First, one SCP-1550 egg was placed in a tank of seawater and left to hatch. When it did, it produced a specimen with gills all along its upper back, behind its eyes, an array of flat and broad tails it could use to swim efficiently. Further examination of the creature revealed that it excreted special mucus to protect its eyes from the salt water, and a swim bladder that was discovered during dissection. The skin of the creature was a mottled blue, giving it natural camouflage in its seawater environment. Next, the team decided to place an egg in fresh water and see what different adaptations were produced. A tank was filled with water from a river behind the testing site, and the egg was placed inside until it hatched. Interestingly, this specimen of SCP-1550 did not possess any gills, suggesting similar circumstances would not necessarily produce the same adaptations. Instead, this specimen had enlarged lungs and a thin, streamlined body for more efficient movement. Next, the team prepared a terrarium meant to simulate the ecosystem of a temperate forest and placed the next egg inside. When it hatched, it produced a specimen of SCP-1550 covered in a layer of brown fur with a ridged underbelly resembling that of a snake. It also had a tail consisting of large tentacles. Along the ridged underbelly, there was a smooth patch of skin with the Dr. Wondertainment logo printed, like a tattoo. The team prepared a different terrarium that simulated a desert ecosystem and allowed an egg to hatch inside. The resulting specimen was cold-blooded, tan in color to blend in with the sand, and skilled at burrowing quickly to protect itself from outside stressors. It was also, notably, one centimeter larger than the previous specimens. The final terrarium was made to simulate the environment of an average urban apartment. The egg that hatched inside produced a creature with leathery skin and eyes placed similarly to those of a chameleon. The demeanor of the specimen was noticeably friendlier than its predecessors, and it acted more like a domesticated house pet than a wild animal. Its most impressive adaptation was its method of eating. Behind the specimen's jaw, there were strands of baleen like those found in whales, which allowed the creature to filter feed on dust and crumbs from the terrarium floor. After these experiments proved successful, the research team decided to test the eggs in more extreme environments. One egg was placed in a vat of molten iron. It promptly burst into flames and was completely destroyed. The head researcher responded, well, what did you expect to happen? Which seems like a fair point. The next egg was placed inside a vacuum chamber, which was then depressurized. The egg promptly exploded, covering the inside of the chamber in an unidentifiable slime. These two less than successful experiments led the research team to the conclusion that SCP-1550 eggs cannot survive in conditions that would be uninhabitable for any other animal. There are limits to the creature's adaptability, but what would happen to an egg placed in a hostile environment filled with something recognizable? A vacuum chamber was filled with seawater, and an egg was placed inside. The chamber was then pressurized to 15,750 psi. This time, the egg was not destroyed, but instead was able to successfully hatch. The resulting SCP-1550 specimen bore a heavy resemblance to several deep-sea creatures, most notably the anglerfish. Like the anglerfish, the creature had a bioluminescent lure dangling from its forehead. It also had gills, dark gray-blue skin, flat and webbed fins, and enlarged eyes twice the size of those found on other specimens. Its teeth were sharp and ridged, similar to those of a shark. The head researcher made a note on this portion of the experiment log, asking, Just what kind of child Dr. Wondertainment is trying to sell these things to that they could live in conditions where a creature like that could be kept as a pet? All adult specimens of SCP-1550 are kept in a sealed 5 meter by 5 meter terrarium, which simulates desert conditions. 
This terrarium is monitored via electronic surveillance, and each of the specimens is implanted with a tracking device. If one or more of the specimens escapes, the area is locked down until all of the creatures have been captured and placed back in their terrarium. All SCP-1550 eggs are kept in their packaging unless being used for testing. As the Foundation does not want the population of adult specimens to exceed 20 at any given time, excess specimens are terminated. Honestly, that makes me a little sad. I'd be happy to take them in if the research team can't keep them. But I digress. Having a pet is a big responsibility, and some people just can't handle the risks and rewards that come with caring for an animal, especially one that can become an accidental weapon if you're not careful. If your child is begging you for a pet, maybe you should start them out with a goldfish first. A goldfish never burnt the house down, though I suppose there's a first time for everything. You're deep in the middle of a late-night study session when you hear something. It's a sort of clicking sound. You try to ignore it and get back to your books, but there it is again. You turn up your music. There, that's better. It was probably nothing. Just the house creaking. But no, there it is again. You need to figure out what is causing this. You look around. Is it coming from outside your window? Another click. It's definitely coming from outside. You slowly make your way to the window. It's dark out, and you can't see anything with the glare. Slowly, you reach out, grab the window, pull it open, and... nothing. You stick your head out and look around, but there's nothing to see. You close the window and go back to studying, but then it happens again. The next morning, you're eating breakfast when you start to hear that clicking noise again, but still nothing is there. On the bus, you could swear it's coming from the seat right behind you. No sign of anything once again. You're in the middle of your test. Vertebrae are connected to each other by... What's the word? It's not going quite as well as you hoped. It was hard to study last night with the constant clicking. But you're giving it your best. At least the noise has stopped, so you can concentrate for a bit. You jump up and look behind you, determined to catch what's making this noise. But there's nothing there. You look around at your confused classmates before sheepishly sitting back down. The cracking noise is almost endless now. You can hardly go a moment without hearing it. It goes on like this for months and months. No one else can hear it, and no one seems to believe you. On one level, you've been able to get used to it, but on another, you never have adjusted to the constant clicking that follows you everywhere you go. You're sitting on the floor of your room, concentrating, focusing hard, trying to will the noise out of your mind. You clench your eyes shut as hard as you can and put all of your mental energy towards stopping the noise, when just then, it's gone. No more clicks. You open your eyes. Could this be it? Could it all be over? You turn around to see it, but it's too late. What you have just witnessed is a textbook example of an SCP-4975 attack, an anomaly that has been aptly nicknamed Time's Up. SCP-4975 is a tall, thin entity with some vaguely avian features, most notably a beak. Its long limbs lack any distinct digits, instead tapering off into formless nubs, and a thick, hardened layer of dark skin covers its entire body, including its beak. In addition to its striking appearance, SCP-4975 is perhaps best known for the distinctive clicking sound that it makes. The vertebrae in its long neck are not connected by any intervertebral discs or other tendons, and each of these neck bones appears to be able to move independently of one another. It rotates these vertebrae constantly, one at a time, from bottom to top ending at its head, creating a constant swinging motion of the head back and forth. It is each movement of these vertebrae that produces the distinctive clicking or cracking sound. SCP-4975's primary behavior is the pursuit and stalking of human beings. Once it has chosen a target, for reasons that still remain unknown, it will begin to follow them, and only the target will be able to hear the clicking sound, though they won't be able to determine where the sound is actually coming from. SCP-4975 will continue to stalk its victims for an extended period of time, as long as 10 months or more, until at some point it stops swinging its head, the clicking sounds cease, and 4975 attacks. In an attack, SCP-4975 uses its long appendages to club and tear the victim apart, 
after which it will consume them, often starting while the victim is still alive. One single human-sized cadaver appears to be enough to last SCP-4975 for several months, after which it will target a new prey and begin the process all over again. Evidence of SCP-4975 has been found as far back as 1538, with a creature very similar to it appearing in numerous German folk tales. Multiple artistic depictions from the time also show a large, black avian creature that can only be assumed to be the same anomaly. In what should be a bit of good news, SCP-4975 is currently in containment at an SCP Foundation facility, where it is confined to a standard steel containment cell. However, as you'll soon see, this containment has not resulted in the end of SCP-4975 attacks, and reports of new incidents continue to come in. In one such report from the Black Forest region of Germany, Foundation agents were investigating the case of a local man who had reported that he had been hearing a rhythmic clicking sound for over four months. The man assumed he was being stalked, or was the subject of a cruel prank, and asked the local authorities to look into the matter. The Foundation agents took the man into custody, giving the cover story to the local police that the man had been experiencing auditory hallucinations and paranoia as a side effect of an experimental chemotherapy he had been receiving. The agents took the man to the last place he had heard the clicking sound, which was a wooded area. As they walked through the forest, the man grew increasingly nervous until he stopped and pointed at a tree, claiming that it was where the sound was coming from. The man froze in fear as the agents drew their weapons and prepared to inspect the tree. They split up and with a tactical efficiency circled the tree on either side to find… nothing. At the same time, the man screamed, pointing at a creature the agents could not see that the man claimed was coming for him. The man was thrown to the ground by his invisible assailant and struck multiple times. The agents attempted to attack where it seemed the invisible creature should be, but their fists and weapons passed through the air as if nothing was there. Another agent attempted to drag the man away, but he was pinned down by a mysterious force. A large wound began to appear on the man's midsection as his abdomen was opened up. Still unable to move the man or stop whatever it was that was attacking him, and with no other options, a Foundation agent took out his gun and terminated the man. Moments later, as the agents looked on, strips of flesh began to be torn from the body and vanish, as if an invisible creature was feeding on the deceased man. But this invisible attack wasn't even the strangest part. At the exact moment the man in Germany was killed and devoured by an unseen force, SCP-4975 was observed to be standing motionless, staring at the southeastern corner of its containment cell, and it was no longer clicking its neck. Any human contact with SCP-4975 has been disallowed, and all current research into the creature has been temporarily ceased, though it has been classified as Euclid. Following these continued attacks and the bizarre behavior it exhibits as they take place, reclassification to Keter class is pending. In the event that a containment breach takes place, it is official Foundation policy that any personnel who begin hearing a persistent, rhythmic cracking noise are to isolate themselves from other staff and calmly wait for SCP-4975 to be returned to its chamber, or for the noises to stop. Perhaps as you wait for the clicking noise to cease, you can amuse yourself with an old German nursery rhyme that is believed to have been written about SCP-4975. Its translation goes, Tick tock, the cuckoo clock ticks. Cuckoo the bird inside sings. As ticks the time, so ticks your heart. May you live long as you hear its song. Listen close, for when it stops, the hatchling comes out of its home. Did you hear it? Did it stop? My child, it meant your time was up. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, and make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.